What are your first memories of the business? From the time I was in it? Um, before you were in it. Um, not very, well, I grew up in Indiana. I grew up in the Midwest, right. and uh, I wasn't a follower of it or a fan of it. My stepdad um, was, and he used to watch it late at night, and I would hang out, when I would hang out with my buddies on the weekends or whatever, I would come in and catch him watching it, and he would fumble for the remote control and change it like he wasn't watching it, like it was a mistake or something. I always thought it was funny. And then later on, of course, it's kind of ironic that I ended up getting in the business. He passed away um, years before I ever got in the business. So I never had a chance to go back and have him tell me how great I was in comparison to guys like Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher. I can remember those guys. They, always, they talk like they ate gravel. That's what I remember hearing them on the TV. But uh, I wasn't a follower of it or a fan of it. It wasn't a goal of mine to get in the business. Uh, working out, when I was in high school, I stumbled into the weight room one day and took up weight training. And that changed my life in a lot of different ways. I was always a kid that was in the wrong place at the wrong time, nothing serious, just delinquent stuff. Of course, those times were a lot different. There weren't, there weren't the serious things to get into that there are for kids today. But um, I took up weight training and bodybuilding. And from that, um, I was bold enough to think after I saw the changes in my scrawny little body that I could make changes in my life in other ways. So I set a goal for myself to uh, an education to become a doctor of chiropractic. So those were my goals. Um, so you were working as a chiropractor while you were bodybuilding, at co competing in bodybuilding? No, or? I was bodybuilding while I was going to school as a chiropractor and uh, started competing, was living in Atlanta, Georgia at the time, and uh, had nearly finished, was a couple credits short of finishing chiro my chiropractic education academically and was getting ready to start the clinical part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of my amateur bodybuilding successes, I won the Mr. Georgia in 1984. I went to a junior Mr. USA contest. I competed at the Mr. America, a collegiate Mr. America contest. But out of those, an opportunity came to get into professional wrestling. Right, that was Eric Bassman, correct? Uh, it was, yeah, Rick was doing something in California. I had, was out in California. Uh, Ed Connors, one of the original owners of the Gold's Gym, the first one. Uh, him and two other guys that turned it into the big international franchise it is today. They used to bring two guys out every year and put them up to train for a regional level, national level contest. And I was one of the guys that they chose, people that they thought had potential to go into professional bodybuilding. I went out there, I did that. I didn't fare as well in the contest I got in as, I, as we thought I would. I came back to finish my chiropractic and he called me about this guy who turned out to be Rick, who had this idea that... Um, take these four guys from four different ethnicities and take them into business, walk up to Vince's door and say, you know, I got this group of guys and I want you to make them superstars. We were all ignorant. He was ignorant. He was naive. We were ignorant. We were naive. We were young. I loved working out. I did want to, my, one of my goals was to become a professional bodybuilder. So I wanted to use all the work and stuff that I had done. And I was a younger student at the chiropractic college than most of the people there. Most of the people there were in their mid thirties were into pursuing a second career, already had had families. I was in my early 20s. And I thought, you know what, I'll take a break because I'd been going through chiropractic straight through. I'll take a break and I'll come back to it later on. Um, make some money in wrestling. Like everybody else, you see people on TV and say, man, they must make a lot of money. And um, I had a couple conversations with this guy, probably not, definitely not extensive enough, but he really just had a general idea. But he had no idea about the business, how it worked, and once I got out to California, it all very quickly fell apart to the point that we were living off peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, going to uh, the deli aisle at grocery stores at midnight so we could get food in our bodies. It was, you know, it was. Right. Um, while you were working as power, member of Power Team USA, that was the first place you met Steve Borden, Sting. Uh, what were your initial thoughts on him? Well, a Power Team USA to begin with was just a, it was the words on a piece of paper. It wasn't anything more than that. It wasn't going any further than that. And that's probably um, is evidenced by the fact that neither Sting or I, during any uh, interviews throughout the year, biographically, have we given any credit whatsoever to Rick Bassman because the guy wasn't credit credible and um, he didn't have his act together. And really what he did wasn't, um, well, it wasn't very positive. Right. So how did you and Sting eventually end up gravitating towards each other and working as the Blade Runners? Well, we were one of, Steve was one of the four guys. Right. And we got, uh, he had set up some training 
through Red Bastine. And um, we probably had about 10 hours of training. They had a ring set up at a racquetball court at a health club. And we would go in there. And then they, you know, they weren't smartening you up to the business. They really would just let you, they would sit back and enjoy the ridiculousness of big guys whacking one another and throwing each other on the ring, you know, taking goofy bumps and stuff like that. But we got that start, and um, we didn't know better enough that we couldn't go out and wrestle. So we started sending, putting packages together, and we sent them out, and one of the packages we sent them to was Jarrett's Territory Mid-Southern. Right in Memphis. Um, what were your memories of working there? What was the territory like? Well, we really believed on the way out there, because I can remember the drive from California to Tennessee that um, – it wouldn't be very long before we would be really successful, that we would make a lot of money, and uh, we would go on and do really huge things. And very soon after we got there, we realized that it wasn't going to be that way. We were started making 25 and $50 a night, had to write home and ask Ed Connors to send us money so we could have the money just to feed ourselves and get a um, hotel room. Right. And um, long trips. I remember the long trips. I remember the the um, the wondering, me and Steve, about the business. You know, figuring it out, knowing that we couldn't ask each anybody else except ourselves, but we didn't know the answers to things. You know, uh, we were smart enough to know that we couldn't ask questions without. Uh, you know, putting ourselves in positions where people would say, you know, you're asking too many questions right now. We knew that. We were also respectful to the talent. There in Mid-Southern, none of us really knew the talent. I mean, none of us were wrestling fans before we uh, agreed to become a part of this thing, to get trained, to become professional wrestlers. We, I remember watching Saturday the WWF shows, but those are the guys we knew. We didn't know the guys in the Mid-Southern territory. What were your initial thoughts of uh, Jerry Jarrett? Um, nice enough. When we got to Tennessee, it was on a Sunday, I think it was, and we just drove into town, didn't know where to go, didn't know what to do. And he lived in Hendersonville, which is just north of Nashville. And we went to his house and he had a huge, you know, huge estate, had a, like a marble floor dancing ballroom and stuff like that. And, uh, I don't know that we thought anything more about it, that we were excited to get started. They took us over to a house and, uh, Ask us a few questions and stuff like that. Made us lock up a few times. Uh, any initial thoughts of Jerry Lawler while you were in the territory? No. Um, we didn't know who he was. I mean, we didn't meet with him at first. Um, of course, later on you find out a lot more. I mean, a lot of guys in the business that went on to even become something in WWF had went down to Mid-Southern and had Lawler had, you know, got in programs with them and, you know, the giant killer, that type of thing and stuff. But we didn't, that didn't happen to us there. Right. Um, the feeling at the time was that you guys were very green, didn't know what you were doing in the ring. Do you feel that was justified? That was like a justifiable um, take on you, on you and Sting at the time? I think our attitudes got us a long way in the beginning. That we were open to listen to, you know, advice. Then we together on the long drives up and down the road would talk with one another about it, what we wanted to do. But... Um, we didn't know enough about the business at that time, and we, didn't, uh, we weren't in a position to say this or that or this or that about how they should use us. Right. Uh, you said that you listened to the advice. Was there anybody in particular that gave you advice that, still ring, that you could still remember and ring out? It was, um, um, well, yeah. I mean, one of the funniest pieces of advice was this guy named Rip Morgan, who is a nephew of uh, Jonathan Boyd and uh, Luke. The, 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 well, they were the sheep herders, and then they became the bushwhackers. Um, you know, when we got our checks and we saw we were getting 25 or $50, we thought, man, you know, we're paying that much in gas just to get up and down the road. And in the locker room one night after we realized who we could speak more openly to, we asked him, we said, how do you know when you're getting effed, you know, like on our pay? And he said, well, you'll know when you're getting effed, but then the question is, what do you do about it? So that was the funniest <laughs> piece of advice we got. And then the Fantastics, they weren't so bad. Um, Tommy was better than Bobby about not feeling insecure. About I mean, they had a gig there. They had a guarantee. They had their thing happening. And Bobby was a little bit more insecure that we were big, healthy, husky guys 
definitely raw talent that could go someplace in the business. But they, uh, both of those guys, we worked a little program with them as long as they could tolerate the potatoes that we were <laughs> laying on them. And, um, but those guys, and then other guys, other guys would, you know, in moments, they'd give us a, um, a Dutch Mantel, Bill Dundee. I mean, all in all, when I look back on it, I mean, we came in, we were green. They used us the best that they could for being inexperienced as we were. But they also didn't use us up and say, go back to California. So, What led to you guys leaving Memphis and heading for Bill Watts' territory? Uh, Steve got hurt. And um, it sort of coincided with them wondering how they could use us because we were so big. And they didn't have any big guys there. And um, a call was made to Watts. And Watts had bigger guys down there. We waited. We stayed in Tennessee a while to, for Steve to heal up. And then we uh, headed down to Alexandria, Louisiana. All right. Uh, what were your initial thoughts of Watts? There's so many things that have been said about him through the years. Well, it takes a while, I mean, to get an impression of somebody. We hadn't been in the business long enough to get any feedback from anybody about how people were. I mean, that comes with time. So... We were busy when we were in Tennessee concentrating on doing the best we could, succeeding at what we had to offer there. When we went down there, um, it was a different, seemed like a more uh, a tenser locker room attitude. You weren't there long. You left and you went to world class down in Texas. What led to you leaving Watts? There was urban legend that Watts had confronted you in a locker room and you refused to back down, and that basically led to you leaving the territory. Is that true at all? Well, that's a combination of everything. I think that was probably the, uh, the, the end event that caused us to part ways. They gave us Eddie Gilbert, and Eddie was a, um, a company man. He believed in not, not ruffling any feathers and doing what they told you to do. And that was okay up to a certain point with me, but when it didn't make sense anymore, I just I'm not the, I didn't have the personality to take it. I didn't like to be handled that way. And Steve was more that he liked to be handled and uh, had have his hand held and taken into what to do. And there was one instance where we're in the locker room in Oklahoma City or Tulsa where Watts came back and ordered me to get down on all fours. He wanted to show me how to work a kick, he said, into the ribs. Well, I'd already heard the story that what he does is he gets um, the, you know, the talent down into a, a disadvantageous position, and then he, you know, he doesn't work the kick. He really throws it in and tries to break your ribs. And I told him that if he wanted me to go down on all fours, then he was going to have to put me down. And everybody in the locker room was really stunned. And then later, of course, after he had left, uh, and didn't take me up on my challenge, Eddie uh, chastised us that, you know, you're not going to go very far in the business if you continue to do that. And uh, Steve didn't speak up, and we sort of had a number of spoken agreements up and down the road, figuring out what we were going to do, that we were going to stand back to back in this business, that if we were going to do it, we are going to do it together as a team. And uh, he didn't say anything. He sort of sided with Eddie in that. And we'd had some blowouts anyway because even starting in Tennessee, um, we were both power guys, but I was more of a power guy. And Steve was a great athlete, but he didn't have the, he didn't have the working ability to utilize his athleticism yet, like he later came to be able to do. So the talent didn't want to take chances in him doing uh, the more athletic stuff because he didn't know how to he didn't know how to work yet. The power stuff was more, more precise. They knew that they were getting into. You pick a guy up over the head, you throw him, they know, you know that's the bump you take. And um, he got um, insecure a number of times because I was always the power guy. And at the time, he wasn't able to utilize his athleticism. So whenever they did the power stuff, they would always say for me to do it. Right. Uh, when you decided to leave, what was his reaction? I don't know. He was probably a little relieved. You know, now he could have Eddie all to himself and he could be one of the boys with the rest of the gang all by himself. And uh... Uh, Were you upset when you left the territory and found out that Watts and Jim Ross was the commentator at the time? They were burying you as 
not as tough as Sting, and Sting stuck it out while you no. had disappeared? I never heard it. Never I mean, heard it. They'd actually no. did it I mean, on the couch. The business is a work. That's what they do with everybody. Right. Um, when you guys split up and you went your separate ways, was there ever a plan maybe down the line that you guys would get back together again and work together again, or is that that was it? No, the plan on. then was really just to survive. Right. I mean, there wasn't <laughs> any plan about a reunion down the road, you know. Let's get the Blade Runners back together or anything. Right. Uh, were you surprised Sting went on to become as big of a name as he, as um, he did? Not surprised, but I wasn't... Uh, um, you know, at the time, I didn't. I, you know, I didn't give much thought to what he's going to do or how he's going to succeed in the business. Yeah. You know, I concentrated more on what uh, on what I needed to do to succeed. Succeed. Right. At that point, you went down to Texas and you became the Dingo Warrior for World Class Championship Wrestling. Right. Uh, where did the Dingo Warrior name come from? A warrior came from. Uh, I had gotten to the uh, arena early that night. There was a TV taping at the Fort Worth Rodeo. And um, was standing around and d d had no idea what we were going to do or what my name was going to be. Hadn't really given it much thought. And somebody had made a comment that he looked, you know, definitely looks like a warrior. And there were a couple other ideas that I said, nah, that doesn't really, you know, I can't see that really working for me. Um, at that point, the look of the character that eventually became the Ultimate Warrior started to take shape with the face paint. And right. The streamers around your arms and the tassels. Um, anything do you remember anything particularly inspired it, or was it just looking for Well, something? me and Steve had painted our face, not like the design that I would started to use, which if you see some of the early Adingo Warrior pictures, it's a smaller design. And then the, uh, the strings that probably just came from the idea, that was about all I could afford at the time, was to go to Hancock Fabrics and buy a couple strings. Right. Um, by this point, this is your third territory. Uh, what were your memories of world class as opposed to the other two? How do you compare it? A lot easier, a lot more, um, it was a lot friendlier. Right. And um, maybe it wouldn't have been, but I think that it, if Kerry had not hurt himself, but I think it still would have been because that's the kind of people the Von Erichs were. Right. They were very friendly. It was a lot friendlier. The trips were easier. Living in Texas was great. Living in Alexandria, Louisiana, was it was a crap. I mean, it was just horrible. And uh, and even living in Tennessee wasn't so great, the trips. I mean, when, and, uh, with the Watts, I can remember uh, driving to do the double shots on the weekends and then driving back to Alexandria at night. And, you know, whoever was driving at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning was going like 20 miles an hour and doing all those goofy things you do to try to keep yourself awake just so we could get back home take a shower, get on the road, and go again. The trips were four or five hours sometimes. You mentioned uh, Kerry getting hurt. That's obviously the motorcycle accident. Were you aware when he came back to wrestling he was only wrestling with uh, one foot? No, they kayfabe that. So they kayfabe it even from the boys? Right. Okay. Um, any matches stand out from when you were working in World Class as matches that you were proud of? Or looking back, you thought, this is where I learned something important? Well, yeah. I mean, it's the, the, uh, the nascent... Ultimate Warrior began to, to come together there. Um, his energy, his mannerisms, his, his jargon, his body language and stuff like that. Of course, I worked with Rick Rude there. That was a good experience because Rick was a professional. He, uh, he had more experience and knowledge than I did at the time, but he, he didn't use it to take advantage. He used it to build a match and make a character and make you understand what you're going to do. Uh, what you could do, the character could do or should do. A lot of the guys down there, Chris Adams, of course there were a lot of assholes too. Matt Bourne, uh, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Bourne was down there, the guy that went on to become a dork, he was a, a real dickhead. Uh, Buzz Sawyer, you know, was a real nutcase. I mean, those guys were really malicious. They really tried to hurt you. Um, Bruiser Brody, I mean, a lot of guys that aren't around anymore. I mean, I haven't written my book yet, a lot of the stories about them. And then I come in, and I'm not a Von Erich in name, but I come in and become popular because people start making the comparisons between the physique and the look, me and Carrie. Right. And um, they didn't like that because Dingo Warrior became really popular, even to people outside of the Texas area. Right. You mentioned Bruiser Brody. What was it like working with him? Bruiser had his spot in the business, but he was a conniver. He was always trying to figure out an angle to work at all the territories and screw everybody over. He was a, um, um, 
Well, he liked to bum off people. He would never get his own hotel room. He would never, you know, you go out with the guys or something like that. He was never the one to offer to, to do the right thing and pay for something. And um, he was always scamming. You never knew, and he was always looking out for himself. Like there's another guy that's deceased now, the guy named Jeep Swinson, who did the Batman movie and ended up dying of a heart attack a few years ago. Bruiser brought him in when he was doing Red River Jack. And I was working the thing with Red River Jack, but uh, he was a baby face. And he, he had this desire. I mean, he told me in the locker room one time that he wished that he was a heel. When a guy wished he was a heel, he tells me in the locker room, well, be a heel now. You know what I mean? You got to be a heel to, to make a point of that, you know, you got a problem with me in the ring. But they brought the Jeep Swinson guy into sort of, he was really green. And we used to, I mean, in Texas, it was a shoot down there. And at the time, I was kind of, I, you know, I didn't quite understand. I, I like working sniff and stu you know, stiff and a little snug anyway. Right. And, uh, but they used to use the chairs, and they would lay them in with the intention of putting me out of the business. Um, memories of working, Gary Hart, working with Gary Hart, rather. Gary was a nice guy. Um, he's well-known having good mind for the business. Was he able to pass on anything that might have helped influence you later on? Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, if he had such a great mind, then why did he ever, he never got it out of Texas? You know, how come he didn't do bigger things in the business? I think sometimes there's just a, a mystique that comes with people that's not necessarily credible. Thoughts on the Von Erics? Really good people that had really big hearts. And I think um, the way that they were raised from, uh, from the time they were little kids, in the business, and their dad was the big, you know, name down there, and the way they used to chase the ring, thinking it was real and everything. I think a lot of the veteran talent got a funny kick out of indulging the little Von Erich boys and giving them whatever they wanted to have that adult people had access to, right. like drugs and doctors and you know, uh, women and you know, all that stuff and everything. And um, it eventually ended up killing him. Right. Do you think there was anything could have been done to prevent what happened to that family? I don't know. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions that carry? I don't know that there are any. Right. I mean, he had an addiction problem. He was a great guy that had a really big heart. He had unbelievable charisma, more than any of the other brothers. And um, they just had this belief, this idea that however they got to what they envisioned as heaven, taking their own lives, that it, it, it wasn't a depressing thing for them per se. Yeah. They thought they were going to meet their big brother Dave and they were all going to be together again. I can't imagine that when they all chose to die, because I was there when Mike did the pills out in the woods in the sleeping bag, and then I became close with Chris too, because he, he had this undying desire to be a wrestler, but of course he was smaller and stuff. Right. He didn't have the athlete, the physical potential to be a wrestler. Right. Um, th in their last moment on this planet, I, I can't believe that they were depressed about it, that they weren't suicidal, like, oh, it just really stinks. They really thought that it was going to be a better thing. It's been written that um, by some that Fritz forced them into the business. Do you think that was the case, or do you I think don't know. they wanted it? Okay. Oh, I mean, yeah, come on, what young kid wouldn't want the adulation that's going to come from that type of thing? Right. You know, so in some part, yeah, maybe later on down the road, they, like other people, came to the realization themselves that that's not success, that's not what's going to make me happy. Right. And maybe they felt like they were still stuck in. I think Kevin maybe was probably a little like that, that he had a responsibility, an obligation to the business, to the Von Erich name, even when he didn't want to do it anymore. Right. At the time, there were rumors that New Japan Pro Wrestling wanted to bring you in and create the Big Van Vader character around you. And instead, they eventually went with Leon White, who went on to become famous using the name um, what was the story there? How close was that happening that you were going to go to Japan? Well, Vader didn't become as famous as Ultimate Warrior, so um, 
I was negotiating. I'd went to Fritz to ask if I could get more money. The money was decent enough. I had a, I had a nice apartment. I was able to do what I wanted to do. I had a, a, a fairly new car. I liked living in Texas. I liked the gym that I frequented. I liked the people that I had become friends with. But there just came a time where I wanted to get a little bit more money, more of a guarantee instead of a hit and miss thing. And I went to Fritz about it, and he said no. And um, it, that coincided with the time that George Scott, a lot of people don't know this story, but George Scott came down there to take over the book after leaving Vince, helping Vince get WrestleManias off the ground. He came down to do a favor for Jack Fritz to take over the book for a while. Tony Atlas came down, that's when George Wells came down. And I found out through the Sportatorium personnel that George Scott was on the phone talking a lot about a guy down here that had an incredible potential. That kid turned out to be me. All that happened at the same time. George Scott came in, I was working to go to Japan, and uh, I went to Fritz to see about more money. Fritz said he wasn't going to give me any more money, and as I was getting ready to do the thing with Japan, the people in New York got curious enough to pick up the phone and call me. And um, I went to the Waco show, they said show up with your gear bag down there, and we'd been going to Waco since I'd been there in WCCW. So, you know, they expected they brought WWF, the big show, came to town. Well, I ended up getting just as big as pop of whoever the main event was because all these people knew me. And they were endeared, you know, to the Ultimate Warrior character. And from that, they asked me, I think a couple days later, to go to Indianapolis. They were doing a television taping. And I worked a dark match um, with Jose Rivera, I think maybe is the name. I don't know. But then it just took off. It took off where they uh, kept me on the back burner, kept me in the sea towns, and uh, just kept testing me to see what I was made of and how the character would work. You know, I don't even think so much the character, just my personality right. and everything, being in the ring, how people liked my look and everything else like that. So this is George Scott who made the initial connection between you and WWF. Yeah. I mean, uh, not he didn't call me and say hook up with them, but I ended up through him, I found out. I mean, George Scott never even told me that he was talking to them. I found out from Bronco Lubick, right. you know, an old referee. He's probably not even alive anymore. Right. Um, he told me. Right. Um, what point did the Ultimate Warrior name become developed? And the first time that I did do a TV taping, they did a pre-tape where they used to put the little screen up in the corner back then wrestled Terry Gibbs. They took me down in one of the studio rooms down in the basement. And Vince said, we want you to do Warrior, but we don't want Dingo. And so I got on there and I said, D -d 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 I'm this Warrior, I'm not that Warrior. I am the Ultimate Warrior. And that's how Ultimate Warrior came to be. There were several things in the Ultimate Warrior character that became synonymous with it. Where did the ideas come for you to race to the ring, shaking the ropes, things of that nature? Was that stuff that you brought to the table or things that their creative end suggested? They were mine. Right. You know, when I started doing that and started working, the veterans in the business told me that I should probably not do it because, you know, it was probably going to shorten my time at the WWF. But I listened to the people and I knew it was the right thing to do. Now, creatively, you develop your own character back then. They don't, you know, they didn't have a, a template where they plugged you into a character. I don't know that they do today or not, but back then they didn't. I mean, it was really between the talent. That's the kind of confidence the office could have on the guys that were... Um, you know, main eventers. The urban legend at the time was that uh, you got so worked up charging to the ring and running the ropes that you were out of gas like the second the match would start because you would need to catch your What wind. do you think? You want to do it? No, not at all. Shit, I gave more at my ring entrance. And people, the fans, got more back out of my ring entrance than most people gave the whole match. Am I supposed to apologize about that? No, I'm not asking you to. I mean, it's physically exerting. Well, but urban legend, what's that mean? Yeah, warrior got blown up. I don't think I'm ever on the record saying that I wasn't, didn't get blown up. But if I wasn't blown up and exhausted by the end of the match, then I didn't think I gave the people the, their ultimate warrior's money worth. Um, the signature moves, uh, gorilla press and the drop, the big clothesline, the splash off the ropes, um, were these things that you developed on your own or things that you and Vince together developed or... Like the basic, like the basic signature moves for the, for the warrior character. No, I think we went to an architect to do those <laughs> things, to put those things together. I mean, I don't get that. I think that, that that's a, uh, I mean, all the other stuff that it takes to make a match. Again, um, I did the clotheslines, I did the press slam, and I did the splash in my finish. I shook the ropes. 
guy would beat up me, me on the back. I'd get to the ropes, get my power, shake the ropes. I did more in my finish than most people do in the whole match. What about the hip tosses, the regular body slams, dropping elbows, coming off the top rope with chops, um, working outside the ring, working the turnbuckles, work, working holds. What about all that other stuff that's in the match? Nobody can show me a video of any match I ever had where all I did was clotheslines, a press slam, and a splash. What about running the ring and the interest that I put, the entrance that I put on? What about all the other stuff that go, the punches, the kicks? I mean, that's what made those things all together is what made the Ultimate Warrior. Um, the entire package was. I think it's a bad rap, a silly rap, when people say, well, you know, he could do clotheslines. You know, he could do a press slam. Right. Uh, so what do you think is the most important part of making a superstar character? The look, the in-ring work, the charisma, bonds with the crowd? Like, if, if you had uh, The charisma is the most important. It takes the charisma to make all the other stuff happen. Right. If you don't have the charisma, then the other stuff doesn't matter. There were plenty of guys there that have uh, mocked me and the Ultimate Warrior character and criticized it that came there with bags and bags and bags of wrestling moves. They never made it like the Ultimate Warrior character did. The charisma is what made the body look. The charisma is what made me go to the gym at 2 o'clock in the morning and say this is what I need to do to be Ultimate Warrior. The charisma is what made me invest the time in uh, the jargon that the Ultimate Warrior had, his own mini universe. Um, the charisma is what made me make the efforts to say, I need to put money into my, my costume. I need to pick up the phone and make phone calls and find out what to do. I need to have, instead of one or two colors or one or two strings of arms, I need to develop a whole palette of colors. Um, the charisma is, is what made me do certain things in the ring that the people got. They understand. And uh, so the charisma is most important. Um, today's wrestling fan, the smarter fan, the internet fan, they pay closer attention to how skilled someone is inside the ring in terms of scientific, technical ability. Do you think they're missing the larger picture of what makes the business run? Who's the smarter fans? You say the Ultimate Warrior fans stupid? Not no, smart? No, no, no. I'm saying... There's, there's a certain segment of fans, internet fans, fans that are, um, they'll trade tapes and they'll pay close attention to international talent and pay close attention to guys of the caliber of players. I would say those people aren't so smart. Because those guys that bring that kind, those kind of skills to the table, they, don't, they are not the ones that people remember forever and a day. They're not the ones that they wish w would come back, that, those, that kind of talent. Um, Do you think you would have had the same impact if you were doing that style? What style? Uh, a more scientific-based style, like say, like a British Bulldogs or Ricky Steamboat had it during that era. If they were, if you were doing that style as opposed to the style that you did, do you think you'd be as remembered? Well, I did the style Ultimate Warrior need to do to be Ultimate Warrior. The style of a performer, like say a Dynamite Kid, was very different from what you did in the ring, or Ricky Steamboat was very different from what you Hulk Hogan would do in the ring. Guys of that, yeah. like they were very. This is what I did. Styles. I looked at all the other people there. Mm -hmm. and getting back again to all these other people that had been in the business, been in the dungeons with Stu Hart. You know, there's a lot of urban legends about that. You know that you got to go there to succeed. I came in the business in '87. In 1990, I had a match with Hulk Hogan, who was the only superstar and still will be the only, you know, real super household name. I had a match with him where he dropped a strap to me in the middle of the ring. The best thing I did was not pay attention to what everybody else was doing. How did you deal with being away from home? How did you deal with training while you were on the road? The road schedule at the time was about uh, at least 25 or 26 days a month. Uh, when I had the straps, I would, on my days off, they would have something for me to do, either go up to Stanford to the studio. They spent a lot of time doing uh, interviews for each separate town back then, uh, much differently than I think they do today. Or I would have to do some other things, promo stuff. So you didn't have a lot of days off. How did I cope with it? You just cope with it. It's what I wanted to do. I wanted to succeed, and this is what I had to do to make it happen. Um, Dynamite Kid wrote in his book, uh, I don't know if you've read it, that no. the road 
schedule was so hard that the only way to survive was to do drugs, uppers, downers, to keep yourself awake because of the crazy hours, um, cross continental flights, things of that nature. Do you think that was the case for everybody? Or no. No? No, I didn't do that. Okay. I mean, I did what I had to do. I did, uh, if I had injuries and uh, I could get something to kill the pain, to be able to work the match, because the people, you know, people have compassion, but after they bought a ticket and there's 10,000 people sitting in an arena, they don't care. They want to see the match. They want to see you perform. I did what I had to do, but I didn't uh, abuse anything. And I don't think that's a story for everybody, no. Um, what was the steroid use like at the time in the company? I think a lot of guys, you know, a lot of the guys used steroids, but it wasn't a thing like in the locker room. There were guys just throwing needles at one another. Right. You know, it was a private thing that people did. At the time, um, in the late 80s and early 90s, you could get a prescription um, and you could go to a doctor and you could have it administered. Right. When I lived in Texas, I used to go to Fort Worth and have it done. I think the steroid thing, talking about it, is a catch-22, so I won't even go there with it. I think there's a certain level that athletes reach where they have to make a conscious decision as a mature adult whether they're going to play by the rules it will take to be the best in the world. Right. And I'd been um, before that when I wanted to be a professional bodybuilder. I went to California. I spent some time when I was a young kid in uh, just out of high school at Indiana State University. I had an experience with a world-class shot putter that um, impacted me in a way where I didn't think about steroids for like another six, seven years and just concentrated on working out and getting big and uh, eating good food and stuff. And um, there's a lot to consider, you know, when you're in a spot like that and you're making the kind of money that you are, what you're willing to do, what kind of sacrifices you're going to make. I saw it as a sacrifice I was willing to make in the... Uh, controlled, non-abusive way that I chose to do it, that I was building a security up in my life in other ways by making these sacrifices. I didn't abuse my body in other ways with alcohol and smoking and staying up late and doing all that. kind. I took care of myself. I had a, you know, I was a healthy guy. I had come from a bodybuilding background and one of the key elements in succeeding in bodybuilding is to be healthy. What was your first memory of meeting Vince McMahon? Uh, I remember meeting him. I don't remember that. Uh, I, remember, I met him at Anaheim, California at the convention center there. I was at Texas at the time. They flew me out there. I remember walking in one of the hall rooms that they have at these big convention centers. There was a table, you know, 50 yards from the door, and it's the only thing in the room. It's a table, and they're all there. Vince is there and Pat Patterson. I don't know who else was there. But it's like they wanted to see me walk across to the table. We had a real short conversation. I was raised in a really, um, in a way to mind my manners and um, have respect for people that are older than me. And so I remember doing that at that meeting. And I remember leaving um, not really concerned about whether or not they would call me or not, that they probably would. Okay, so your first televised program was against Hercules Hernandez, who's no longer with us. Uh, any memories of working with Hercules and also Bobby Heenan, who was his manager at the time? Yeah, I mean, it was great to work with Herc because he was, you know, he was, uh, he worked snug too. Right. And so he was the right guy to put me with there at the very beginning. And he was uh, interested in making the match work. You know, the guys there in the beginning didn't have a problem with, they knew what was going on with the Ultimate Warrior character and what, um, that he was going to go up in the business. And Herc knew that he was a stepping stone, and so he did everything to make, make it happen. Right. Uh, your first pay-per-view match was the first Survivor Series. Any memories of that? And is there a difference pressure-wise when you're performing on pay-per-view as opposed to just in a live crowd? No. No, because you were always on the road. It was just another day on the tour. Typically, you had to go someplace the next day and make another town, right. or you just... You had been to a number of towns consecutively for 5, 10, 14 days. I remember when I first went up there, you would go on the road for uh, 14 to 25 days, not come home. Right. Any particular memories of the show? That was the uh, eight-man tag elimination matches for the first time? 
Where was it? I believe Richmond, Ohio. Okay. No. Um, how close were you with Owen? And uh, any particular memories of close, Owen? Close. I liked Owen. Owen was a good friend of mine. And, you know, some of the other guys. I got along with the ring crew guys and stuff better than I did with some of the talent. Although I didn't, there was no... Um, blatant animosity between me and anybody. Right. You know, some of the things that, are, that have went back and forth over the recent years since I've been, or while I've been out of the business, they're, you know, they're new to me. Everybody got along with everybody. Did uh, any of the WrestleManias, any of the shows stick out as like, this is like a pivotal moment for the Warrior character? Well, I mean, you know, WrestleMania six, of right. course, and for different reasons than other people think. I mean, it was a goal I set when I got in the business to be able to succeed in it at its highest levels. And that was um, a statement that the Ultimate Warrior character had. Did you notice anybody, any of the boys treating you differently once you were in that position and you were like towards the top of the card as opposed to where you were previously? I never really paid any attention to how they treated me. I was a nice guy. Um, I'm, I'm never uh, in the business different from a lot of other people. I've never been envious of other people that have talent. It makes me work harder. And in this business, that's, those kind of people are hard to come by. Um, I wouldn't let how other people may have misperceived why I was becoming, Ultimate Warrior was becoming a player in the business. I wouldn't let their misconceptions of that, they can make up their own ideas of what, about what I was doing, how it was happening or whatever. You know, I was be, favorites were being played or I was, you know, doing, th you know, whatever they wanted to do, however they wanted to make it out in their mind. I didn't let that stuff bother me. My goal was to succeed. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't interested in playing those, those kind of games. And I never uh, allowed myself to. On the road, you did a house show series with Andre the Giant, one of the last house shows tours he did before his health forced him out of the ring. Uh, any memories of Andre as a person and also what it was like dealing with him in the ring? Yeah, Andre was, um, he was great with me. Of course, he either liked you or he didn't. There was no in between. Um, he worked, I think, with Randy before he did that run with me, and he didn't like Randy at all. I don't know what the reasons. I mean, you just don't ask Andre why. But he liked me, and the reason why I think that he did was because he saw how hard I worked and how much I put into my character and my gimmick. And that's why he uh, was okay with doing what he did. I mean, Andre didn't do what he didn't want to do. Right. And uh, I was always very respectful to him. And uh, sometimes being respectful to somebody is just leaving them alone. You know, not pestering them. Rick Rude came in, obviously someone you had worked with before, and they began a program with you and Rude for the Intercontinental Championship. He was there before I got there. Right. Was he? Okay. You're right, he was. I apologize. Um, were you excited about getting back in the ring with Rick? Yeah, I liked Rick. Um, any specific personal memories of dealing with him? or I mean, he's no longer with us. People involved in the decision-making process now. Right. And... Um, they didn't have that then, and there was a, there was an, a, throughout the company, there was an overall optimism about working, being on the road, and having the opportunity to perform in front of people and be your character. And I remember that about Rick. In other words, nobody really drugged themselves, you know, like it was a drag to be in the business. I mean, there were a lot of uh, people got tired from the road travel and the schedule and being away from home and stuff. But for the most part, when you got to the arena, it was time to do the match, and the show was going on. Everybody was optimistic. Everybody went to the ring, and, you know, it wasn't, uh, it was exciting and energizing to go to the ring and perform. Rick was like that. He was meticulous in what he wanted to do. Um, he, uh, he, made, he wanted to make the match work. Uh, you dropped the belt to him at your second WrestleMania, the Intercontinental Championship. Right. Um, were you surprised when they wanted to take the title off of you, or did you expect a longer run? No. No. Did it matter to you at all whether you were holding a championship or not? Some guys are very different in that respect where some people say they almost they care more about their position in the company and the titles more than anything else. Or no, I mean, my, uh, what drove me was 
being able to go out and perform and develop and evolve the Ultimate Warrior character. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, you also did a house show run with Bobby Heenan where uh, the, he was forced to wear a weasel suit if he lost. What are your memories of working with Bobby? Um, he's obviously well known as a very funny guy. And what was it like working with as someone as powerful as you are with someone who was pretty much towards the end of his career in the ring and wasn't as athletic as he used to be? Well, I don't know. He should have said something to somebody if he had a problem with it. I mean, you know, that I wasn't in charge of setting up these matches, these blow-off matches that they had, these gimmick matches and stuff. Um, I mean, I never went out to the ring to try to hurt anybody or anything like that. I thought they were kind of goofy. It was a night off to work those matches. Bobby himself, well, you know, he was just a two-faced bastard. He always has been in the business. And uh, so... Um. WrestleMania six, would you say was the biggest night of your career? Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of great moments in my career, match wise and stuff. If I sit down and made a list, I could think them through. But yeah, I mean, of course, it was a different time. Hogan was the guy; he never dropped the belt that way. Never yeah. dropped the belt. When did you uh, find out that they were going to go with you versus Hogan in a? I don't know for sure. Three or four months before that, right. I remember I was at the studio in Stamford and uh, doing some. Uh, a photo shoot for a lot of the merchandise that came out that time. And uh, at, at the tail end of the photo shoot, Steve Taylor got a phone call to come see Vince in his office. I went over there and Hogan was there. And they said that this is what they were thinking about doing. Right. Um, I didn't ask any other questions beyond that. I thought it was great. You know, it's awesome. I mean, um, there are all kinds of uh, different steps I, that I was taking and becoming successful in the business that always kept me excited at the time. You know what I mean? Right. Um, they first teased the match at the Royal Rumble where you and Hogan ended up in the ring by yourselves and a match was every man for himself. So it was pretty rare that you would see baby faces in the ring against each other at that point. Um, what was the crowd reaction like? Or was oh, that I something? don't know. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm getting to a place in this interview where these questions are they're sort of getting redundant. Like I'm supposed to, you know, every hair on my neck that went up on every match that I had, I'm supposed to remember it. Um, a lot of that out there, and maybe a lot of the other people didn't look at it this way, and it sort of leaves me at odds with a lot of the talent that's out there today and wants to take every opportunity they can to criticize what I did in the business. It was a job. It was a goal for me to achieve, and every time I got in the ring or went to a town or every big pay-per-view or every big, uh, you know, this Royal Rumble thing that you're talking about, it's about doing your job. And um, maybe that's not as warm-hearted as people would like for me to remember it, but... Um, uh, what type of preparations went into the match? For me to do my character, whenever I was at a show, I, there was a whole mindset I needed to get into. There are a lot of guys in the business that could just pull up their trunks. I mean, just really, literally step out of their, their street clothes, right. pull up their trunks, and just, you know, walk out to the ring and just get warmed up out there and do their thing. I had to become just a whole manic thing before I even went out there. I had to be left alone. I had to typically, I would stand in the corner and uh, F it, F it, F it to summons up the, the, the brazen attitude I needed to have to go out and from the jump, you know, as soon as the music comes on, run through the ring, concentrating on where I'm going to run, how I'm going to, what steps I'm going to take so that I don't get stuck by the people, them grabbing my strings, making my way up to the ring post, getting on there and doing that. I mean... I was always concentrating on what I needed to do. So a lot of physical warming up. I was not the type of guy that could just, uh, somebody like a Greg Valentine, his body is sort of like, all his bones and everything are sort of locked. You know, he's like an old dinosaur. In other words, the way he is backstage is the same way he's in the ring. He doesn't have to worry really about pulling something or breaking something. And I always had to be concerned about that. Was there a lot of pressure going into WrestleMania six, knowing that you were going to be carrying the entire company? <laughs> carrying the entire company come on there's a lot of people that make it work look i've been defensive over the years when people start to say that titan made the ultimate warrior that's bullshit people don't can't make what this thumbprint makes me as the person able to pull off the ultimate warrior right. but um it's a two-way street 
and I've never denied that. But, um, you know, pull the I, I never looked at it in those terms. I think probably Hulk and those guys did. And I think that's because they were trying to make themselves out, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there are a lot of different people that make the business work. This match you have to have memories of. So what was it like being in front of 60,000 people and being the first person in the modern era of wrestling to pin Hogan cleanly? Well, I mean, it's awesome to be able to go out and perform at that level in front of that many people in a match that had the kind of chemistry it did and stuff. Will I ever be able to remember it exactly like it happened that night? I don't think so. But it was, um, you know, everything worked. You know, not just, just to have gotten to that place in my career as the Ultimate Warrior and had a match with Hulk Hogan, even if the finish was different, would have been something in itself. But the fact that the, the finish went, was the way it was, the fact that the chemistry was the way it was, um, that time in the history of sports entertainment, WWF, the way it was, that time, place, and history, I mean, all of it just, it was magic. Right. Um, are you aware of what Hulk Hogan wrote in his, in his autobiography about the match? No. He said that afterwards, it was un he took the championship belt, came back to the ring and handed it to you in an unplanned, in an unplanned moment. Oh. And his reason for this was to get sympathy for himself and take the focus off you because he knew at some point he was going to be coming back. Mm. What do you think about that? Well, I think that um, Hogan's whole life has been a work. And there's nothing about his life that was, that's ever been unplanned. So he probably had it planned out from the beginning. Kurt Henning? Mm -hmm. Who's no longer with us? He worked with Mr. Perfect. Most of the people aren't. They're no longer with us. We're gonna get into that. Um, what did you think of working with Kurt? Kurt was a good guy. He was funny. He was good in the locker room. He's always pulling ribs, and he was, he was a great athlete. It's easy to work with guys like that that sort of got springs in their legs. Right. They bump all over and stuff. You just, you know, you throw a punch and they go. Um, Randy Savage, is he as intense as it's said that he is? Yeah, he is. Uh, you know, we both got A personalities, and uh, are typically when you get two people of the same type of personality, there's a clashing, right. but there wasn't between us. It was, we had really good chemistry, and I like Randy as a person. He was a really stand-up stand -up guy. I think he's mischaracterized in a lot of ways, too, because he is. Right. Um, you teamed with uh, Road Warriors, who were working as Legion of Doom against Demolition, did a lot of six-man tags. Right. Anything stand out in your mind about those matches? Because it was pretty much like every major character who had worn face paint other than Sting working pretty much the same program at once. No, I liked working with those guys. Of course, they were in the business as the Road Warriors and just incredible success and made a huge impact on the business way before we got in it. They painted their face. They, had, they were using the concept as warrior. But when they came in, I was already established up at WWF, and I didn't push it in their face. Right. I had respect for them because I'd watched them when I first got in the business. And we both let one another do our warrior things, we, you know, like in interviews and stuff. I would put them over for how incredible I thought they were, how Ultimate Warrior would act like how incredible he thought they were, and they would put Ultimate Warrior uh, over. All right. Um, were you surprised when WWF came to you and – Told you the decision to have you drop the belt to Sergeant Slaughter? No. No. Was I surprised? Yeah, were you surprised? Did you expect a longer run? I mean, obviously that was going to change your your financial place in the company. Well, you don't get to a place in a business like that unless you're, you know, you're willing to drop it when they say they want to drop it. Okay. So, right. you know, you want to drop it. And what they did back then was is that, uh, look, it's not good business for them just to have unless they've, you know, they no longer have any use for you or they've got ulterior motives to just have you drop a belt and then not have you ready to go into another program. Right. I dropped the belt. Randy came to the ring, hit me with the scepter over the head, and that led into the, what I think was another, um, was a match that uh, belongs in the same category as WrestleMania Six. I was going to bring that up. Uh, first of all, I wanted Good. to ask you, um, they used, Sergeant Slaughter's character used the Persian Gulf War as the backstory. Um, at the time, it was, Angle was pretty controversial. They got a lot of bad publicity from it. 
Um, do you remember what the wrestler mindset was at the time? Was it just business as usual and this is what's going to drum money? Well, or? look, I didn't have the knowledge and the opinions that I do today and the things I'm doing. I was a different person. Okay. Um, I can't remember anybody being upset enough. You know, come on, I've been in all the top locker rooms in the business and listen to the guys whine and moan and bitch, and they never do anything about it. Right. Not one of them. What do you so, think that is, that, guy, that the wrestlers were always bitching? You know, I don't do think anything. they were going to take their cue from USA Today because they were bashing WWF because they're using the war as a storyline. Right. You know, come on. So let's talk about the retirement match with Randy Savage, which I would agree with you is one of the greatest matches that you were involved in. Um, what was any particular memories of the match? More the, memories again. Well, you and your memories. Those who are going to want to watch this. <laughs> There's are a song know. or something, isn't there? <laughs> memories. Something like that. Um, about the time they brought in the Undertaker character. Mm -hmm. or, what was your first reaction to the character? Because that was, other than the warrior, the first real supernatural character that they had. I liked it, man. Yeah. Yeah. I liked it. I liked Mark. He was a good guy. And... Uh, they brought him in and kept him off the TV thinking about what character to give him. And then we did the, the angle. And then the first town we worked was Albany, New York, I think. And they, the people really got behind the Undertaker gimmick. Are you, are you surprised he had the longevity that he's still going today? I never thought about it, right. you know, whether he would or he wouldn't. I think it says a lot about him, though. Right. Um, where did the idea for the angle where you were locked in the coffin come from? Do you remember who came up uh, with it? They that? came up with it, but it wasn't my idea. But I wasn't against it. I mean, you know, a lot of people thought they were aghast. God, you're going to get in a coffin. They're going to close it, man. It's almost blasphemous or something. Actually, I joked. I said it was the most rest I'd had in a long time. <laughs> that led to you doing a series of body bag matches mm -hmm. with Undertaker. Was there anything in particular that stands out about working with him as a performer? Or differences in the matches because these are two almost like – well, you and Hogan were superheroes in a way, but here was like two very vibrant superhero type characters against each other. Yeah, it was creatively stimulating because he was new and he was, you know, the thing was, was to work the match, but get him over, right. you know, build him up as a talent. And um, I wasn't as I've never been. I've never been envious or jealous. I mean, I was in a position really to probably work the match in a way or give advice about how we set up the match where it wouldn't have been too beneficial to his character continuing to grow and, and build. But I was, um, I was energized by saying, well, we got this thing that people like, so we got to work a match where um, Ultimate Warrior keeps his over prominence, right. you know, keeps his baby face prominence. But at the same time, I think that we should engage your character. It's not a devilish, evil thing. They like the character because it's uh, it's different. So, yeah, it was neat to be able to work a match and try stuff out every night. That's really neat to do. Right. Um, at the same time, they also began a series of vignettes where Jake Roberts eventually turned on you uh -huh. and left you buried up to your neck. Yes. Um, where, 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 what's your take on Jake Roberts? Because he's, he's a character in the business and a person in the business that everybody seems to have a million stories about. So what do you Well, I think Jake has probably revealed more stories and more of the substance about himself than anybody else could add to it. I mean, he's a liar, and he's a lech, he's a loser, and um, there's not much more to say. Getting back into some of the things you were doing inside the ring at that point, um, you worked a little bit with Sid Vicious, who's working as Sid Justice at the time. Mm, only a couple um, of times. Yeah, I think. a couple of times. Uh, what were your thoughts on him and his persona and how he, he was as a person? Well, you know, Sid came in after I left in 91. And um, so we never really got to know one another. And he, when I came back in 92, just like I did when I came back in 96 with Hunter Helmsley, um, he just misunderstood. I was, as a businessman, saying, this is Ultimate Warrior. I'm, Ultimate Warrior is this. This is the way he's accepted by the people. This is how he is a money maker. Right. And he had been the guy. He had been the big, tall guy with big arms and big muscles and, you know, you, you know their version of intense character that they had at the time. And when I came back, I mean, I think he was, uh, 
at the least, he's, you know, his feelings were probably hurt. And at the most, you know, he uh, was offended and he wasn't going to go along with what that needed to be done. Were you surprised when he walked out on the company? Um, I don't know. You've asked me surprise a lot of times. I never really thought about it. Like, I didn't think, okay. you know, I'll be surprised if he walked out. I don't know. Okay. You end up working SummerSlam 92 against Randy Savage in London, which was probably one of their biggest houses of all time. Right. Um, what was any remembrances of how it was for the crowd in England as compared to Sky Dome or another big building? Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was really neat. That was a great event. Right. Um, at that time, Ric Flair came in, which first time he worked WWF. He did matches with you and Randy and a bunch of other guys. Mm. What were your thoughts on dealing with Rick and working with Rick? And well, Rick is a two faced person. You know, he's two faced. I mean, um, he's you know made comments that he couldn't have matches. I thought he was the best. Yeah, he. Um, I thought he could work with anybody. I thought guys like Ric Flair could work with the broomstick. I think it says more about him than it does about me. I think he's a, uh, I don't think, uh, different than a lot of people think, that they admire his tenacity to want to stay in the business for so long and stuff. That's a, I don't think that's a thing to admire. I think it's a little embarrassing, and it's become pathetic, and uh, he should uh, you know, be a real man and have found something else to use his, his notoriety in a, in a more productive way, instead of staying in the ring. Um, he, so rather you, were scheduled to do a program with Nels, the convict. And then I don't he, remember that. He, he, you guys had did a face-off at one of the TV tapings, and then he was abruptly dropped. He, gotten in, he actually uh, physically assaulted Vince McMahon backstage at oh, the show. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Do you remember what the reaction was among the guys and for a wrestler to actually put his hands on Vince? Like was he a I hero among the wrestlers, or was it, I can't believe he did this? The guys are always angry at Vince in some way for something, but they were never big enough to go tell Vince themselves or do anything about it. They just kept eating it and eating it and eating it. Right. So it's kind of a very weak manner to, you know, get your rocks off because somebody stood up to Vince when you didn't have what it took to do it, you know, to do so, you know. Okay, uh, you were scheduled to work the Survivor Series pay-per-view in 1992, and you left the company pretty abruptly. What happened that led to your departure? Well, Vince started concocting stuff up to save his own butt when it came to the steroid thing. You know, I kept put, I put pressure on him to follow through on the things he agreed with for me to go out and do stuff outside the business so he could go ahead and start grooming the fans to accept the, the entertainment of the little or guys, and then uh, the, they, you know, the government started applying the, the heat when it came to the steroid thing. So he needed some scapegoats, and he used me and Davy Boy. Right, is, is that what he did? What did he do? Well, he started making it look like uh, our the drug test we were taking, our levels were high and stuff, but the uh, and turned that into a reason why he needed to get rid of us, right. so he wouldn't have to deal with it. And in his mind, he thought if he did it that way, then he had the upper hand as far as controlling us outside of our wrestling, outside of our contracts at WWF. In other words, if he, if he terminated the contract and made it look like we did something wrong, then we didn't have any powers even outside the WWF. Right. That we didn't own who we were, that we couldn't go wrestle for other people and stuff. Okay. And uh, I mean, even the doctor is on the record, Pasquale at the time saying that our levels were not, um, indicative that we were using steroids or doing drugs at the right. time and stuff. But that didn't matter to Vince. Vince was going to do what he wanted to do at the time. He made up his own stories. Okay. After you left WWF in November 92, you made very few independent wrestling appearances from that point on. Right. Was there any reason for that? It was just the money wasn't there? Well, in 91, just... I didn't make any. Right. You know, uh, I made a few. They were good money. Right. And... Um, but I really wasn't interested. I get contacted by a lot of people. I mean, you're one of the smart, inter you know, the smart wrestling fans. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that they got a remote control and they know all the talent and they think they know what's going on behind the scenes and they think they could become a promoter or put on a wrestling show. 
A lot of stuff is just bunk. Okay. Uh, you were involved very briefly with a promotion called the National Wrestling Council in Las Vegas. How did that come about? Um, that was at the tail end of 95. I had my gym out in, uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona. Right. I'd closed it in September of 95 and started uh, retrofitting it and uh, to change it into a training facility. Right. For a, a couple ideas, three ideas actually. One was uh, um, as a key holder facility where private members only, they pay a, a larger membership fee, but they get a key to the place and they right. get to come and use it. Another one was I had had being in Scottsdale, Arizona and uh, people finding out about my gym, a lot of other professional athletes that were at the end of their career or had gotten cut or whatever were great athletes wanted to know how to get into the business right. and so I started thinking it through and I met a lot of guys that probably were really great raw talent they just needed the good direction they didn't need to go to a wrestling school like Matt, uh, Buzz Sawyer had right. where he just stretched them and broke a couple bones and took their money and so I put together the idea you know you take these guys you bring them in I had a ring in my in my uh, gym and uh, bring these guys in and develop them, turn them into characters. You know, typically characters in the ring, guys in the ring, whatever their characters are, is just an amped up version of who they are naturally outside the ring, right. their personalities, their quirks and stuff like that. I'm naturally intense about everything I do in my life and Ultimate Warrior was just a manifestation of that, an in-ring manifestation of that. Right. Um, so, I uh, had put the promotional stuff out for this Warrior, Warrior University, it was right. called. And when I started getting that back, um, I got approached by uh, TC, I think his name was, out, and, yeah, and about doing a show, working with Honky Tonk Man. Right. And I'd uh, gotten in my own ring and started working towards, you know, that I was going to get back in the ring and do something. Right. I mean, use Ultimate Warrior for it. I put together a commercial and everything. And so it just worked out well to do it. I went over there. It was good money just to shoot over to Las Vegas and do it and get back in there and blow up a little bit <laughs> and uh, get ready to do the camps at Warrior University. Right. Uh, you worked the first match against Honky Tonk Man. There was talk that you were going to – well, I know Martin himself had said that you were going to be co-promoting the company. I talked to him about it. I was interested. He was drawing a full little house over there, and um, he also – had a gig. I went over there and sat down with somebody. Uh, I want to say the Aladdin Casino. It was a not one of the the, the cushier places that are there now, but it was a, right on the strip. <clears throat> and he had a deal with somebody there that they wanted to do shows. So I was interested to get involved. And uh, I actually we promoted a show, the first show to take place at this casino and stuff. And I went over there. I spent the night in that hotel that I was supposed to work, but TC didn't come through with his end of the deal. Right. And if you don't do that, that doesn't work for me. Right, so that was the second, the second appearance second that you were supposed show, to make? Yeah. Okay, because uh, that was always pretty much, a, there was always a big question of what happened, because everybody knew that you were I in was town. in a hotel. Yeah. I stayed in a room in the hotel that night with my girlfriend at the time. Right. We got up the next morning, we came home. Exactly. There were conditions he was to have met when I got there at the hotel. Based that were uh, that stemmed from the ticket sales and everything that had taken place, right. the numbers and stuff that he'd given me. Right. So it was a financial situation. And he didn't come or? through with his. He didn't come through with his. Okay. Into the deal. Um. So the Warrior University led to you also did a workout video at the time. Yep. And there was also the comic book deal. Yep. Um. How did the How did the outside projects come together? Well, I started using my the uh, character that I spent all those years developing, creating in entrepreneurial projects. Right. I mean, in the early 90s, I was already thinking, how am I going to, can I use this character later on? Ultimate Warrior by the, all the, the little kid fans always represented like a true-to-life superhero comic book character that walked off the pages. So I built, I wrote the story. I created a story around this graphically created Ultimate Warrior comic book character. And uh, with the ultimate goal was to do an animated movie with it and stuff. And then the workout video was a natural for me. It wasn't a workout video to show people how to work out. It was a 30 minute thing. Like you put a, a cassette in a piece of music in before you go to the gym to get you inspired. And uh, it was more like that, which was different than anybody else had done at the time. 
and I did, was doing t-shirts and hats, and I had a pro shop in the gym, and it just grew into doing mail order. Looking back, were all the outside projects worth your while? Yeah, they could have been. I mean, one of the conditions that I had with Vince and them, when they called me, Vince called me at the end of 95. All right, we're about to get into that. That actually happened because I was doing the Las Vegas thing. They had his lawyer stepped in, and uh, I told TC, I said, no. You know, once again, they made the outrageous claim that they owned the character and nobody else could use it. And really, it was a bluff more than anything else. I mean, they had the money and the lawyers and stuff to keep pushing it through, like they did eventually in our five-year lawsuit. As long as somebody would stick it out, I mean, ultimately you would find out, the court would, uh, that, you know, no, they didn't own it. I owned it. I created it. And, uh, but they stepped in. Vince called me. We talked. I said, Vince, I said, I'm not really interested in coming back. He came to my gym. I wasn't there for the day. He came out for like the NBA series, all-star game, came out with Kevin Nash. Kevin Nash was living out there at the time. And I wasn't there. My manager called me. I didn't go to the gym. And uh, he ended up getting in touch with me with Osbert D'Ars, the guy that was in charge of licensing at the time. Or what I said, look, I said, Vince, I said, I can't come back under a generic contract. Forget about it. I'm not coming back. It's got to be different. You don't own the character. I do. I got all this money invested in all these other things I'm doing. I'm not giving it up just to come back and be a wrestler. And ultimately, he sent me a couple few days later, he sent me a generic contract. And I called him. I said, Vince, man, you're, F you. It's not going to happen. And then Linda called. And I knew Linda because I'd stayed at Vince's house. And, you know, Titan always acted like, you know, you're part of the family. So I knew everybody. I was close with Shane. I had a relationship with Shane. It was like big brother, little brother for a while. He came to Texas and stayed with me. And um, Linda got involved, wanted to meet with me in Phoenix. I went and met her. And it was, I just had a sense that it would be different. Right. I would handle things through her, not Vince. And she was the go-between. And so we worked out a really unusual, unique deal. And the deal was that I had all these other things going on. I get to bring them back and plug them into your merchandising and marketing network, and I'll come back and be a wrestler. You pay me a price for that. And four months after I came back, we had a real clear separation between what the intellectual properties. Feel the Power was Ultimate Warrior as a wrestler. Always Believe was Ultimate Warrior as a comic book character, Warrior University, and everything else. Right. And those are the two catchphrases that have come to identify the two. Right. Of course, the NFL has Feel the Power now. <laughs> um, the... Um, and then after I came back, four months after I came back, they uh, started lifting. Right. You know, the, the plan from the beginning was to do it, but they, they got caught. Okay. Um, there's a famous story about your WrestleMania return in California that Triple H, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, came to you and he threw out all these suggestions and you basically said, the match is not about you, it's about me. Well, I didn't hear any suggestions, but what happened was, and I didn't know Hunter. Right. You know, all I knew was I was coming back as Ultimate Warrior and... The guys that were on top, that Vince was using on top, were the B-team players when Ultimate Warrior was there. Right. And I wasn't going to come in. Look, there could have been a lot of adjustments that could have been made over time. And there were even for the four months that I was there mm -hmm. with Ultimate Warrior. But to come back after three years, I was going to come back and make an impression. And it wasn't about that I had a, a malicious plan to disparage anything that Hunter Hearst Helmsley had done uh, in his career up to that point right. or to say he's not any kind of talent or anything like that. It was just come back. It wasn't harmful. You know, people talk about things are harmful, you know, doing the job and this and that. They are to some degree in the beginning, but they're not as much today. You can fix things like that. Right. And um, I told him what I wanted to do, that I was going to come and make my entrance. You give me your finish. I'm going to kick out of it, and then I'm going to give you a press slam. We're going to go home. And he said, okay. And uh, then he went and got Jerry Briscoe. Came in the locker room. We went in the shower, and he proceeded to have Jerry Briscoe try to tell me that he had all these ideas. And I, heard, I listened to Jerry for about five seconds, and I looked right at Hunter. And I said, if you ever have anything that you need to discuss with me, you need to come to discuss it with me face-to-face, -face, man man-to-man. We're done. And that was it. Right. Did uh, he ever apologize? And he did it. No, and he didn't need to. He, you know, he didn't need to, per se, to apologize to me. I can understand how he would have took it. But I'm sure today, I, you know, and in some ways, in some ways, I could probably take a little credit for what he's done in his career. Right. Because I know 
if somebody had done that to me, what I would have done, I would have said to myself, we'll see, we'll see. Right. And look what he's done in the business. He's, he's you know one of the most I mean? powerful people in the yeah. company. So uh, the, the it's kind is, of funny. I've thought that over the years. I've thought, you know what? I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> but uh, he did. And I can understand how he would have took it that way. But if he wants to tell the story a different way, then he's the puny little bastard on the inside that he was back then. Right. You know, he's not the 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 guy that's uh, built a, a really credible career in the business and seems to love the business. He's still the puny little shithead that he was in 1996, and I'd tell him to his face again. Right. How would the company change from the last time you were there? It hadn't really. I mean, there was the click going on between Nash and Hall and those guys, and those guys are scumbags. Right. I mean, they're they're just, uh, you know, the the kind of ribs and stuff that they would play and tearing people's stuff up. And there's always they always got ulterior motives to destroy people instead of concentrating on what they have to offer and what they can do. They got to play both sides and try to, you know, damage other people's abilities from the backside. I wanted to talk to you about some of the names that were on top at that point. We already discussed Hunter. Uh, Shawn Michaels, what did you think about? You tag teams with him a couple of times. What did you think of Shawn as a performer? Um, definitely talented and skilled. I mean, you, you know, incredibly talented. He had a, um, always had good confidence about his own abilities in the ring and stuff. Um, not a lot of people's taste, you know. Um, but, I mean, you can't fault the guy for the, the talent that he had to be able to do things he did in the ring. Right. Uh, Davy Boy Smith, you mentioned earlier that you guys were the scapegoat for Vince, and here he was. You and Davy were both back in the company in heavily pushed positions. What did you think of working with Davy? What did you think of him as a person? Davy, you know, I've written about Davy when he died about – how unfortunate it is that he didn't grow up and he continued to do um, immature things that he was able to get away with when he was younger and they mm -hmm. eventually, you know, they ultimately they caught up with him. Um, I have an affection, uh, a special place in my heart, I guess, in my memories for Davy Boy and uh, Dynamite Kid. They sort of took me under their wing when I went up there and um, had a lot of fun did a lot of goopy stuff and made a lot of light of being on the road and being away from home and stuff. All those guys, I mean, I never, I never faulted. I never sat back and faulted anybody for whatever skills they had. Right. Anybody. I'm not on the record doing that until people started criticizing me and I got out of the business and legitimately got on with my life recognized that wrestling and what I did there was a great chapter in my life, but there were other things I could do. And people just, I don't know, they got offended by that. And I got defensive right. about saying, you know, hey, whoa, hold on a minute. At that point, could you see the beginnings of Steve Austin becoming such a huge star in the company? No, I mean, I, 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 but I didn't see that he, he wouldn't become a talent. He was a real hard worker. And there was something about him in the ring, even in his black boots and black trunks, that uh, just a grunty style, like he was grunt, you know, the way he worked his style. And uh, like he just wanted to keep going from one thing to the next. And uh, no. Uh -uh. We didn't touch on Bret Hart, who was a pretty big uh, star in that era. What, 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 did, what did you think of Bret as a performer and dealing with Bret through the years? I liked Bret and I liked the, you know, when I went to Canada, I would stay with Davy Boy and them. I would go out to the Hart home. Uh, you know, I was good friends with Owen. Owen, I traveled with Owen and Jimmy Powers up and down the road. Those are the guys I traveled up and down the road with. I'd bring them in my car. I had a limo. Come on, let's go. Bret Hart, I remember celebrating in some Midland, Texas or something, his birthday. We all stayed out late one night, and we all ended up shacking up at this just, uh this rotten hotel. We couldn't find any more rooms and stuff. I liked his family. I liked his kids. I liked Stu. And they always... You know, I was always respectful of who they were and where they came from and everything like that. But then later they got, you know, um, they just started criticizing me for no reason. 
you know, and I made some comments about Brett. You know, I think Brett probably would have felt better about what he did if he had pursued litigation like I did. I saw it all the way through, and I think he stayed bitter about that, you know, that he went to WCW, and even though he made the money, he didn't get to finish his career the way he wanted to. Well, I thought people like Brett that had been in business for so many years knew how to handle all kinds of different business waters, whatever they were. They could make the best of it. How do you think you would have handled that situation in Montreal if Vince had changed the finish the last night you were Oh, I don't know. That's a what if. Okay. You know, I think in some ways it was all, the camera was in the right place at the right time too often for that documentary. So you give think, me a break. So you think it's possible it was it was yeah. it was a work it was a work. Well, in some ways, maybe not all the way. Okay. But I think everybody got okay with it. I think even how personally affected he may have been, uh, and how much of a shoot that may have been, that for the purposes of a documentary, they stepped back right. and saw what they could get out of it. Um, you know, and I did make the comment after Brett had the stroke, you know, that uh, because when he continued to criticize me, like when people would ask him in his columns or something, he would write, uh, somebody asked about the ultimate warrior, and, he, and his response to them was, Where, what are they thinking? You know, like, why, you know, why even raise that guy's name when, you know, a god like me and the other ones are around or something like right. that? And, um, you know, he did go make. He did go down to Florida, and he did hug Vince. Right. I don't get that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on the timeline. Uh, you missed several dates because there was a death in the family, and WWF had announced that they weren't going to let you return unless you put up an appear a, a bond that you would forfeit unless you. No, what happened was was I came back for the third time. Linda came into the picture, sort of acted as the go-between. And once again, the whole, you know, they always sold themselves as like a family. Like I had the communication going back and forth between Linda because I worked with the office when I was back in 96 very closely because my projects and the, the division we had between the two intellectual properties right. to make sure there wasn't any mistakes. Well, there were a bunch of mistakes from the very beginning. We ended up, me and Linda, calling them to falling through the cracks as we were working things out, to iron things out, make things clear, move ahead with a working relationship. And, um, I mean, you know, I have letters from her where she signs them, signed them, love mom. Right. She got to know my fiance at the time. Um, I did a Chicago, uh, Chicago Comic Con convention. It's an annual event that's been going on for years. It's huge. My comic book was coming out. I did a bit, we did television piece on it on the television, WWF. And she came there, spent the weekend with me and my fiance at the time, got to understand the natural crossover market there. And, I, you know, I, I've talked to her a lot about that, what wrestling needed to do, and they've done it. And it, did I do it for them? No, they've done it. But I talked then in 96, before it even happened, that what they needed to do to uh, diminish the stigma professional wrestling has with it, they needed to cross the threshold into legitimate entertainment. The, and um, the comic book was a way to do that because in my self-study, as I self-published my own comic book, I found out that many of the blockbuster merchandise, movies and merchandising and marketing successes start as comic books. Right. And I said, this is a natural, you know. And uh, so they got behind the comic book that was part of the deal. And uh, always believe being... The, the catchphrase that we used, was used to delineate between the wrestling thing that they could capitalize off of, feel the power, and what I was to use through their own merchandising and marketing network, the licensing show came up in New York. Right. Big, huge annual thing. You go there, you sell your, your product, you sell your, your intellectual properties for people to put them on stuff. And I went there. They didn't want me to come. So you went for the warrior property? No, oh, they didn't want me to come that year. They said, don't come, there's no reason to come, Jim Bell told me. The same guy that's wrapped up in this Jack's, Jack's Toys deal. We're going to get into Jim Bell in a second. He said, don't come. And uh, I said, what do you mean, don't come? I just came back, and the talent always goes to the licensing show. Right. It's so the it best PR. It was an appearance for Make WWF. an appearance. Okay. Yeah, and he said, don't come, you don't need to come. And something told me, after all this other falling through the cracks had gone on, the mistakes they had made using the stuff they weren't supposed to, something told me to come. So me and my, well, now my wife, Dana, we got on a plane. We came to 
the Javits Center, came to New York, walked in the Javits Center, walked around the corner, and the whole theme of the, uh, the booth was always believe. Oh. And there wasn't one picture of Ultimate Warrior. Always believe was the whole thing. What was your reaction when you saw it? I was sick. I was sick, man. I was sick. I almost fell to my knees and just started throwing up right there. It was unbelievable. So, I listened to Jim Bell try to explain it. Like you didn't know, you didn't know. Right. And I tolerated it as much as I could because as soon as I walked into the place, people recognized who I was. So I had to put on a face, sign autographs and pictures and stuff. Standing there, you know, this one phrase that separated in our contract what they were to use and what they weren't supposed to use. And um, I went back to the hotel and called Linda. And up until that time, if she, if she wasn't there, her secretary would tell me when she was going to call me back without fail. And that night she didn't call me. Next morning, about 11.45, she calls me and says she didn't know. And then Vince gets on the phone saying shit happens. I said, Vince, I said, your people have been lying to me for four months. He says, people lie to me every day. So according to the terms of my contract, they had violated it and it needed to be corrected. The contract was capable of being suspended until they made corrections and we got it worked out. So I got on a plane and went home and that's when they created the whole um, thing about doing the appearance bond, put Gorilla Monsoon on TV and over the next week the lawyers went back and forth and they made certain claims and we made certain claims and eventually it turned into me having to file litigation. Right, you filed the uh, lawsuit for a breach of contract, correct? Breach of contract. And that was when they started with the issue of who owned the Ultimate Warrior name. Well, yeah, basically they were saying, look, you're not former or anything. Whatever you did for the last 15 years, we own it. You can't even refer to it. Basically, that's what they were saying. And I had already, you know, all these other projects that I was doing, they were, I'd already started doing those. Right. I mean, it wasn't something, some idea I had to later do. I was already doing all that stuff. Right. Um, we mentioned Jim Bell previously. Do you place the blame on him for not dealing with what he should have been doing on a licensing end? For not, like, paying attention to what was supposed to be happening? Or do you think, do you think, well, I guess my question is, do you think he was without the a doubt? The deception was through and through. Okay. so Because it could have been worked out. Right. Vince and Linda could, Linda could have stepped up to the plate. And the dates could have been missed that I missed, right. but we could have worked it out. Right. They didn't want to. What happened was Vince eventually stepped in, Linda being the one that I always worked with, he stepped in and said, I'm not doing this anymore. We're not doing this stuff because he said, you know, I said to him, Vince, I said, Vince, you're not living up to the terms of the contract. He said, I didn't drink. He said something to the effect, I didn't make up that contract. I didn't sign that contract. Linda did right. something like that. Right. What was their reaction when they learned that you had filed a lawsuit? I don't know. I don't know. Um, we have fight. Right. You know. I know it took five years. Uh, at what point did you make the decision to change your name legally to Warrior? 93. So it was before you had even come back oh, yeah. at that point? Okay. Way before. Um, did you find it ironic that your name, you had changed your name to Warrior and here you were fighting for the rights to it? Like, th at any point you said Well, they couldn't just... take those rights away, okay. you know, um, for me to use the name. I mean, they made certain outrageous claims like that. Like, you know, I changed my name in 93 because I foresaw getting back to when I was talking about when I had the fallout in 92 mm -hmm. because Vince agreed to let me go do things outside of wrestling. Have an agent outside of WWF, right. not somebody at WWF that has the power to reject or deny um, opportunities for me to go out and do something outside the wrestling ring. Right. And... Um, I went to California and I had a great agent at the time for a big entertainment agent company out there and I wanted to do action movies. I wanted to use who I was in my look to do action movies. I thought it was a natural and I had incredible discipline to do whatever it took, you know, even make at the, in the beginning uh, monetary sacrifices and pay just so I would get put, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, have people put around me that could direct me effectively so I could go on and be successful at it right. and stuff. I lived out there for six months. Anyway, that's another story. I just eventually got sick of the phoniness of it and everything. But 
Later in my life, uh, as I got on with even the entrepreneurial projects and the comic book projects and what I was doing and then started thinking about public speaking, got interested in reading and writing the great books of the Western world and all the classical literature and the, the classical philosophy and everything, um, Warrior came to mean something deeper to me. You know, I'd come from a family, my dad had left when I was 11 or 12. Um, and uh, I came to realize and see how important it is that and what a name means to somebody and what should be handed down along with it. And when I met my wife, when we decided to have kids, she took it as her surname and my kids have it as their surname. And we have a, you know, a coat of arms and a mission statement and stuff. And even though we live in contemporary times, uh, we're doing something that's more traditional, going back to, you know, uh, centuries ago. Okay. Getting back into the lawsuit, um, were you happy with the final results? No. No, but they, they were, I had to accept them. My lawyers did a, a complete 180 on me right. on the day that we went in to start the trial, the day that the thing settled. Just unbelievable. I ended up fighting them for a whole year because they tried to, you know, they tried to screw me and uh, had to file my own briefs in the courtroom with the State Bar Association out of Arizona. Fought for a whole year in that. Are you allowed to talk about what, what you mean by they did a 180 or? Well, yeah, they basically caved. Right. All the confidences that they had given me about what the case was worth um, and what the potential was on the day of that we were to start the trial and the judge uh, called the jury pool in. It was on a Friday. He said, I'll, if, if we're going to start this thing on Monday, people will be called back, but today we're going to let you go. He came down from behind the bench and said, Vince and Linda and their lawyers were there. I was there with my lawyers and said, look, he said certain things and said, look, the coffee pot is full. My schedule is free. We're going to spend the whole day trying to work this thing out. If it doesn't work out, we're going to start the trial on Monday. Late that night, it settled, um, and largely because I had no more confidence in my attorneys right. at all. So now you own, you completely own the rights to the Ultimate Warrior Ultimate name. Warrior now, okay. yeah. Are you aware they're currently fighting with Marvel Comics over the rights to the Hulk Hogan name in court? No. Do you find that ironic? I don't know. You know, I knew that they never owned it. Um, it was never a big deal to Hulk. Whether he owned it or not, I don't think, you know. When was the last time you actually had a conversation with anyone in the McMahon family? Um, well, 98 was a lot. I mean, uh, 2001, the day the trial settled, was the last time I had words with Vince, only to tell him that, uh, I, you know, that I, you know, refused to shake his hand, and I said that I'd been disrespected enough. I wasn't going to be disrespected anymore. And that was the last words I had with him. What was his reaction when he refused to shake his hand? Well, Vince is probably pretty good over the years of not showing his reaction. But, I mean, I, I you know, well, he's not going to put it over. Right. You know, I'm small potatoes to him. But, he, you know, I know on a deeper level that nobody else has ever done that to him. Right. Have they ever once approached you about coming back? No. 98 was the last time they approached me. Vince sent me a fax in the middle of the night for an offer that's bigger than the money guys are making today. Right. In the middle of the night before I went to w, before I was going to go to WCW. It's only a couple sentences, and it's an offer, and uh, it was funny to get it. What led to you not accepting it? The previous disrespect? Yeah, and it was really, it was just a, it was an incredible monetary offer, and he expected that the money was the thing that would make me pick up the phone and come back, but it was all the other stuff. It was always all the other stuff. Right. Okay, let's talk about WCW. Yeah. All right, first of all, before you came into WCW, they had um, the Renegade, who is played by a guy by the name of Rick Wilson, who's no longer with us. Yeah, he's dead, too. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's dead, too. He killed himself. Um, he was obviously a clone of the Ultimate Warrior character. Were you aware at the time that they were even using, like, a ripoff of the character? Well, I found out, but, you know, I mean, I was the real deal. I was the guy that did it. Right. I mean, even stepping outside from having been the, the owner and the creator and the performer of it, I just, it was always, 
amazing to me how anybody could think that's him. Right. You know, that's him. Um, so you were never offended? I, well, I didn't appreciate it. Okay. You know, I didn't appreciate it. And for, I had a good lap out of it because what I thought was, was that they got together, Hogan and uh, Jimmy Hart and those guys over there and Bischoff, and they really thought, and I really believe this, they really thought that if they did that, that I would track them down with gear bag in hand and say, how dare you do that? I am him. I really thought that they were thinking that they were calculating that I would do that, that I would show up at the next TV. They were trying to draw me out. Right. And I thought, man, this is really funny. So um, what led to you coming into WCW? Who, who uh, placed the first phone call? Um, I had a conversation with Hulk probably in uh, 97 or something, he called me. Right. And he was uh, slobbering all over himself about how he was going to do all kinds of great things over there. And like that I should just show up to, to go along for the ride. And I said, well, I'm really happy doing what I'm doing. I'm not interested in, you know, coming over there just to go along for the ride. Right. And... Uh, making it very clear that, you know, because he was going, talking about uh, the, um, talking about um, the, the authority he had over there to r literally just write checks, basically is the way he was saying it, that they approached him, they wanted him in there, so he had the checkbook, and he was, could do anything. But, also, in the same sentence, telling me, but, you know, I'm thinking things through. I'm not necessarily just going to be wild with writing the checks. But I made it clear to him that if I was going to come over there, then it was going to be a pretty wild check. And uh, we had that one conversation, and then uh, Eric Bischoff ended up contacting um, maybe me, maybe my attorney out of New York. Do you think Hogan wanted you to come in just so he could get his WrestleMania six back, his yes. win back? You? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Yeah, I mean, come on, is that what is that sick? Yeah, I mean that is just that's hilarious, man. I you know you know when I was over there, there's a guy that's insecure, man, and I didn't know it because I had the chance to spend some time with him. He invited me to come to his place. Mm -hmm. After we did a TV for WCW in Miami, he invited me to come to his place the next time before, the week before Halloween Havoc or something like that. So I went down there early. I flew to Tampa and I stayed with him one night. And man, it was an eye-opening experience. But there's a guy that's insecure, really bad. It was, uh, it was disheartening to see somebody with so much, had done so much and can really do anything and has incredible uh, power to get attention, right. to get something... Uh, you know, get some, some empowering messages out to young people and stuff, and he's not using it. Right. How would you compare Bischoff to McMahon? Well, uh, you could break it down a bunch of different ways, but the simplest way would be that the McMahon is a leader. Right. He's a leader, and he's a planner, and he follows through with his plan. Bischoff was in, he always used to be, use the word spontaneity. You know, the, the spontaneity is one thing. Showing up an hour and a half before live TV when millions of dollars are on the line, that's lunacy. There's no, that's not spontaneity. That's lunacy. You know, you need to be in a straitjacket. So I think he let anxiety get to him. He probably could have visited and got, got his prescription filled a few more times than he did. All right. So what was the backstage scene like in the company? Was it just utter chaos? Yeah, everybody was doing whatever they wanted to do. Right. No, but there was no leadership at all, no direction. How do you compare your WCW run to your runs in the WWF? Was it as fulfilling for you? Brutal. <laughs> Come on, you thought you thought you were going to catch me on that one? No. <laughs> it was the, the Dynamite Kid used to say Brizoodle, man. Right. That was Brizoodle. I mean, that match with Hogan was the worst one. And it is ironic that I had one of my best ones and my worst one with him. That was actually, I was actually going to ask you if you yeah. thought that was ironic. Um, I mean, they didn't put me in the ring. I had a six-month contract. See, when was it? 
Halloween Havoc, end of October. My contract ran till the end of November or first or end of December. And after we had Halloween Havoc, the next night they were in Phoenix. Well, I lived in Phoenix, so it was, you know, it was just a natural that I was going to show up there. They did the little spas at the end where I came in and, you know, threw everybody out of the ring. The next week was Kansas City. I only went to the TVs. I show up at Kansas City and nobody expected me to be there. How'd you get the plane ticket then? The office, I mean, that's how, you know, <laughs> chaotic and unorganized the office was. The office had sent me a ticket to get there. So I got there and I wasn't, you know, nobody expected me to be there. I tried to get to talk to Bischoff. He wouldn't talk to me. And for the next couple of weeks, I think I called, well, the number that I remember is I called 16 times. He wouldn't return my call. And all I asked him to do, I said to him, look, this doesn't make any sense. Put me in the ring. Let me work matches. My stuff can happen in the ring. It didn't make any sense. The kind of money that they paid me. And then for the last two months of my contract, I didn't even, of a six-month contract, I didn't even work it. I mean, they didn't give the character an even opportunity. That was stupid. The first 15 minutes was a launching pad to do really great things. You know, OWN was a great concept. You know, Ultimate Warrior was already over as, a, as an intense killer. I mean, you know, I tore my bicep when I came back, and I was back, and I was in the ring at Halloween Havoc four weeks later. There were guys that tore biceps and didn't show up for six months and still got paid for it. So, I, you know, there was nothing that I did to turn them off to the idea of using Ultimate Warrior in some way. Uh, you know, they took OWN, which was a great concept. One guy can't do everything. I went under the ring after I did the 15-minute spiel, Good versus Evil and Hogan. We did the trapdoor thing. I went down there. I had to wait till everybody cleared out of the building. When I came back through the curtain, all the crew people were there. And they were congratulating me, saying, man, that was awesome. This is really great that you know, you're here and the way this thing turned out. Nobody from the office, Bischoff or Hogan or anybody, called me or nothing. I didn't talk to any of them. And then on the, the, the next Monday was TV. On Friday, I called Hogan. Brother, brother, you went over our head, he says. He got offended because I was working the gimmick out there in the ring. <laughs> and um, they blew it. I didn't blow it. Right. What did you think of the, uh, the idea of uh, the entrance with the trap door and the smoke and all that? <laughs> <laughs> Did you like it? Did you think it was appropriate for the I character? thought one time. I thought they were going to use it one time. Right. You know, the first night. And they started using it over and over again. Right. But look, again, only one, got one guy can do one thing. They were already convinced after the first 15 minutes that this guy came back and made an impact that went over our heads. And that's not the plan we had. The plan is, is get him into a match with Hogan and let Hogan pin him so Hogan can feel good about himself. And, you know, so the fact that I came back, it did something good. Do so you think they automatically cut your legs out from under you the second you were on TV and they saw that oh, reaction? Yeah. The first 15 minutes was great, man. Did I have all the ideas? No. But it takes a team. It could have worked out really great. Right. By then, too, you know, entertainment had already, you know, taken its provocative turn and was into degenerate behavior and, you know, the signs and the... Yeah this and the that and you know the fat stuff phat whatever it is i don't know it's just a bunch of junk right uh were you aware that the wrestlers are going to the ring without knowing that there was a trap door there and they were getting hurt by taking bumps no. on it do you think the company should have been more responsible about telling the wrestlers i didn't know they knew yeah. didn't know yeah that's how davy boy no davy of. boy man davy boy was gone before he ever took a bump on that door go watch the tapes he was all doped up and stuff. He was, you know, Nightheart told me on a plane one night that those, they were smoking crack and stuff, that they were into smoking crack. Right. And uh, something was wrong with Davy Boy. That yeah, I mean, he couldn't even walk right. Okay. I was actually, my next question was uh, how, there's a lot of talk about how bad the drug scene in WCW was at that point. Did you? I ever... don't know. You know, I have uh, I've just never been into any of that stuff. You know, I've never done the cocaine. I've done the pharmaceutical prescription drugs that I can get when I need to have them. Right. You know, you're on the road for 20 or 30 days in a row and you're sleeping three hours a night. You got a, tr a schedule like that. You know, you're, sometimes you're going to do what you have to do. Right. But I never got abusive with it and I never did the street drugs. 
Okay. Um, come back to WCW. That brought you back for the first time in years to the same company with Sting again. Um, what was it like seeing him again? How had he changed as a performer and a person? What was it like teaming with him? Well, we never had the opportunity to really sit down and talk, but he was cordial. Right. He was nice. He was gracious. You know, uh, he was uh, he was friendly. One time in the locker room, we had a chance to sit just for a few minutes together, and he was um, he was he was friendly, and he was he was you know gracious and welcoming. That you know I was there and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, you know, you got, that's a lot of years to go. He right. had experience success and money and fame and everything himself I mean it you know it does something to you the way you process that stuff you become a different person uh, the match that we worked in together got thrown together at the last minute and it really didn't mean anything okay uh, just a couple of thoughts and some talent um, what did you think of Goldberg who is pretty much a really hot character at that point in I was complimentary of Goldberg and uh, matter of fact, the first night I was at WCW, I pulled Diamond Dallas Page and Goldberg aside, and I said that they had inspired me in my training to make a comeback because of their intensity. I uh, told Goldberg, I wrote about it on one of my posts one time when I got offended by his comment relative to somebody asking him when he was a kid, he dressed up for Halloween as Ultimate Warrior, and he sort of mocked it and dismissed it. The truth was, ultimate, he was a mark for Ultimate Warrior. And uh, he was a teenager at the time. He wasn't even a little kid. But he didn't have the confidence in himself, uh, you know, to say that. And that says a lot to me. It, it shows a lot about the insecurity somebody has. When I was at WCW, I talked to him a few times when he was caught up in what the head games that Nash and Hall and Hogan and all those guys were playing, the big soap opera of it. And I told him, I said, look, man, I said, you have the potential to do incredible things in this business if you just keep your head on straight and don't get into all the mind games and the head games. Now who somebody else is going to do that? In my shoes. Nobody. No, not in this business. And that's exactly what they were doing. They were effing with his head because they knew he had skills. They knew he had talent. They knew he could do something. And they didn't want him to just focus on that. They wanted him to mess with his head. Throw a little bit in the mix. And that's what the business is about in a lot of ways. Vince was always good about that. It wasn't just do your job and be productive and we'll leave you alone. It was always throwing something into the mix, you know, to mess it up. Um, next to it, we, we touched on them a little while earlier. Hall and Nash, what were your thoughts on them and WCW? Yeah. And just shit stirs? Yeah, shit stirs and backstabbers and... You know, they spend just as much energy. I mean, there's a lot of those guys in this business and all kinds of business, but they spend just as much energy in how to be destructive. Right. Probably more energy on that than they do about how to be constructive and use their own um, abundant skills right. that they have. Was there anyone you were particularly close to backstage in WCW, or you just kept to yourself at that point? Yeah, I kept to myself. Okay. Um, what was the plan for the NWO versus One Warrior Nation storyline? Where was it going when you left? Did you have any idea? <laughs> In the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> Where it eventually went. I don't I mean, it just became ridiculous when the LWO, right. Latino <laughs> World Order. <laughs> no, what it, it fit for me, and it would, have take, it would have taken a round table discussion of creative minds, but One Warrior Nation was... Uh, 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 um, part of everything that I'd been doing outside the ring and where I was going in my life. Right. OWN spells own. Right. And it's, it's relative to what I even do in my life today to go out to save people. Look, because you're born, you have the potential. Is it that black and white? Would that have worked inside the genre of professional wrestling? No, but it was a start to work with something. Ultimate Warrior was the type of character that already established itself in one way. It was, it was possible, and that 15-minute segment proved it, to take it to another level with the good versus evil thing, right. especially and tied into where we are culturally today. It's the only discussion that's taken place. Good versus evil, right and wrong, true and false. Is the line between the two, are they just blurred or is there a line? That type of thing. It could have worked really good. It could, Ultimate Warrior was a character that could have pulled it off. Did I have it down to a science, an exact science? First time I came back, no. But when the whole team 
turns and runs and thinks it stinks because it's going to take more work to do than just going out there and grabbing your crotch and trying to, you know, be degenerately cool and hip, then it's not going to work. So you were injured? Yeah. And yes. Did they ever talk to you again after you were injured? Did you ever hear from them again? Well, yeah, I was injured, but I came back for Halloween Havoc. I got injured at the, what's the event they have before that? Oh, full brawl. No, the one where I ran in the cage. They had the double cage match. The war games. War games, maybe. Yeah, that was a I ran ball. in, chased Hogan out, swung right. from the cage. I tore my bicep then. Right. I mean, what I did, you know, look, I'm a great, I'm my own self, best self-critic, but what I did then was great. I kept working out with a rubber hose six to seven hours a day so I would meet my commitment to be in the ring at Halloween Havoc. And there were guys that were tearing their biceps and they were taking six months off right. and milking it. Uh, there was nothing that I did. Even Bischoff said it, you know, in a, when asked about what I did and who I was as a person. Why do you think that match in Halloween Havoc went so wrong? Well, because Hogan didn't want to put any time into it. He wanted to do the basic stuff. He didn't want to sit down and say, okay, let's, you know, look at this incredible piece of wrestling history we have between us in 1990. Because the, the, the premeditated plan was for me to come back and he could feel good. Right. You know, he could, uh, it would uh, reinvigorate maybe a few more extra pieces of hair on his head or something like that for him to get the, you know, the fall on me. So what led to you leaving the company? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I explained that already. They didn't call. I mean, yeah. was I going to buy my own ticket and show up? Nah. Um, do, you regret, do you regret your run there? No. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, do you think it hurt the aura of the Ultimate Warrior to the fans? or? No, I think, you know, maybe people... Of course, I don't worry about what people think. That's probably pretty obvious. Right. Anybody that goes to my website and reads what I write and what I say. But, you know, the fact that very soon after that they fell apart sort of, you know, do you doesn't think, lend any credibility. To, do you think there was anything that could have been done to stave that off or prevent it? Or was it, it was already too far gone by the time you were even there? No, I think if they, somebody would have come in with the organization and said, look, you know, seven days a week we're going to plan. Right. We're going to think this thing through. Everything is fixable. Okay. In 1999, Extreme Championship Wrestling was going to debut nationally on the Nashville Network. Uh, you wrote on your website and, and brought about the idea of coming into the company. How close was that to ever actually happening? Never. I never talked to those guys. You know, they used my name. And that's disrespectful. This is uh, ECW, Paul Heyman. Yeah, Paul Heyman and those guys. They did a 1-900 call, dropping Ultimate or dropping Warrior. Right. And then they dismiss it. They discredit it like it doesn't mean anything. They don't use it. Would you have? You know, uh, and I don't say that stuff just from afar. Mm -hmm. Would you have wanted to do any appearances there if they had handled the situation differently? I wasn't. I didn't have a yearning to do any appearances there. Look, I I always have time for good business. Right. I don't have time for any that isn't. Okay. Were you? Uh, if somebody would have called me and talked good business, then I would have listened to it. Were you familiar with the product at all when you had uh, made the comments about bringing no, up the idea? No, I knew um, Bob. Uh, what's his name? Um, Ryder. Okay. Bob Ryder had come out to, uh, in the early 90s, had come out. That was just getting on the internet and right. doing stuff. He was working for and, Prodigy. Yeah, right? and he was a big fan of ECW and eventually became friends with Paul and those guys and stuff. And he talked right. about it. I only knew it through him. He sent me a couple tapes one time, and I watched it. It was wild and stuff like that. Um, look, I'm open to listening to any kind of business proposal somebody has right. but I'm not sitting by you know out uh, in the desert blowing smoke signals with my gear bag waiting for somebody to set up a ring and I just you know let me be a part of it you give me 50 bucks and a couple hot dogs right um, on a related topic um, TNA what conversations did you have with them when they began uh, planning to Jeff call well first uh, I think Vince Russo called me. Right. I've talked to, to Vince. I haven't talked to him in three or four years, but um, 
two, three, or four years. I haven't talked to Vince. But I have talked to him over time. Right. Um, and uh, he had told me that the Jarrett's were doing something and I should talk to Jeff. And I did talk to Jeff. And I said to him the same things that I tell everybody when they contact me about wrestling. Look, I understand the worth and value of Ultimate Warrior. I got a different hat on now. It's my agent hat. Okay. okay? So don't be offended by me uh, negotiating on his behalf. But most people call me, again, thinking that I've you know, got my face half painted and one boot on, and I want to get in the ring. So we had those conversations, and I talked to his dad, and his dad didn't get it. Right. And finally, I told him in an email, I said, look, you don't get it. I said, I'm not in the business. I wasn't in the business. I'm not in the business for the celebrity part of it. And if Ultimate Warrior is going to come back, then you're going to have to recognize that he has a value, and I understand that, and I'm going to have to have time um, to prepare to come back because I'm not interested in coming back and disappearing disappointing people in their expectations of what the ultimate warrior is other guys will do that they're okay with it I won't he didn't get it and then uh, they also talked about how they were going to do a product that was more family oriented and the next thing it started turning into something degenerate they didn't get that I said to them I'm not interested in doing the degenerate stuff they didn't get it they didn't understand those words and then they turn it into something like warriors hard to war deal with He's difficult to do business with. Right. And that's not the case. The case is people don't hear what I tell them. Okay. Um, June 2004, TNA began taping TV in Orlando at Universal for a national show on Fox Sports. Jimmy Hart went on a radio station down in Florida and said that you had called him about coming into the company. Was yeah, he there... lied. Okay, so there's no truth to that. There's no truth to that. So and I why... can't believe he did it because so... Jimmy... You know, I would have expected more out of Jimmy. I know Jimmy. You know, I would have expected more. And uh, I was really surprised that he did that. But uh, like I told, said on my website, when I want to say something, I say it on my website. Right. Uh, I don't call them. They call me. Right. I don't call them. Um, are you aware about the comments Jerry Jarrett made about you in his book? No. I'm about to read them to you, so I'd like to hear your comments. All right, and you're probably not familiar with the book. Basically, it's his day-to-day -day journal of the launch of TNA, the company. I don't read that okay. stuff. Um, he says on April 7th, he had a good conversation with you. April 8th, well, my good conversation with Warrior turned out to be just like my previous conversations with him. He says one thing during the phone conversation, and when he sends you the contract, it does not resemble the original, and he has changed everything he has agreed upon on the phone. I feel stupid for not realizing why he spent most of his career sitting at home, Perhaps he is paranoid from dealing with WWF and WCW, but I cannot make up for that. I will not try again. And then he goes on to um, say that you had called Russo and you were shocked that there was no further interest in you. Was there well, neither one of those are true. You know, Jerry Jarrett sit on the phone with me and whined and complained about what Vince McMahon is and how bad Vince McMahon is and how much he's been screwed over by Vince McMahon and his boy's been screwed over. He never stood up Vince McMahon. I fought Vince McMahon in a lawsuit to make a wrong right. He didn't do it. I don't need to, I don't need to take uh, any uh, life advice from Jerry Jarrett and what I'm doing and why I'm sitting at home. I'm happy. I'm productive. I don't ask anybody to pay my bills. And I'm not the punk kid that I may have been back in the uh, 19, what was it, 80. 86 or something that I was when I went there and made 25 or $50 a night. Right. That said, if they came to you with the right offer, would you be interested in working for them now? If somebody came to me with an offer to get back into the ring, which I could, I could do okay. with the discipline I have for another five or six years, if I made a commitment, and it would cost somebody a lot of money, it would cost somebody a lot of money to do it. Uh, if the deal was right and there were... Um, legal negotiations to protect it all my interest and there was no way that um, those obligations from the party I dealt with could be reneged upon then I would go back to the ring I would do something in the ring have you seen anybody that you've spotted are you familiar with any of the product today do you still follow the product no I haven't watched it uh, by 
watched a couple of the taped appearances that I had from WCW in 98. Okay. Um, WWF, uh, and I still call it Titan Sports. I mean, you know, not out of any, for no particular reason, it's just as what I know it as. Um, I haven't watched it since 1996. I don't watch it. I don't uh, flip through the channels to try to catch it. Um, if I see it on the guide on the Dish Network, I don't go there to check it out for a couple seconds. I haven't watched it. Um, what type of training regimen do you still maintain today? Dancing. A lot of dancing. <laughs> <laughs> well, my four-year-old daughter, Indiana, she's got me doing a ballet. It, it's pretty good exercise. Uh, I still train like a, a maniac. You know, my body weight is a lot less because I don't eat. I don't have the same, I don't dedicate the same amount of time to uh, maintaining that muscle mass that I did when I was getting paid money to be, you know, ultimate warrior. I've said it before, I think it's a little, it would be a little pathetic and a little shallow if I had to continue to be the big guy in the tank top at the gym. Uh, to hold on to that particular image. I've grown and gotten bigger and incredibly muscular in other ways in my life, and I'm proud of that. But, yeah, I still train. I go to the gym every day at 4 o'clock a.m. and uh, get my workout done, and then I go to my office and I work. Um, you've been very critical of older stars who have remained wrestling, even at their older age. Um, why is that? Why are you so critical? It's embarrassing. You know, it's embarrassing even outside of just, looking under in a microscope of the wrestling business. People, society, our neighborhoods, our communities, our world depends on that people when they reach an age where they are grown up, they think and act like it and they, you know, effectively and uh, properly mentor young people. And when you see, it's embarrassing for everybody, even people that may enjoy to see seeing Ric Flair in the ring say something. There's something wrong with this, you know. It's like the contortionists that can stick their head all the way, you know, clear back up over, you know, beyond their their ass. You know, you look at it and you go, there's just something uncomfortable about this. And it's the same way with grown men like that. Um, and um, more so, you know, the guys that didn't grow up and now they're in the grave. And their families are left behind and their loved ones and everything else. Was it worth it to continue to hold on to an image of themselves that ultimately caused them not to be here anymore and they have nothing to offer? Right. Uh, you just touched on it, but you were very critical on your website about the deaths of Rick Rude, Kurt Henning, Davey Boyd Smith. Um, so many guys from well, your era. Well, Rick Rude I wasn't only because I just got tired of it. You know what I mean? I mean, I got tired of making responses Davey Boy I was, Kurt Henning I said something to the effect that, you know, he died in a budget hotel room, you know, hovered over his dirty little bag of street drugs, and right. you know, that's exactly the way it was. That's the scene, you know, behind the yellow tape. Right. Um, is there anything that could be done to stop this uh, tidal wave this of death? This vicious cycle of self-destruction. No, there you go. Is there anything that can be done? <laughs> is it just a lack of maturity on that? Yeah, on the people guys? need to grow up, man. They need, quit, you know, they need to quit sitting in their own pile of poop and just get, life is not easy. There's no guarantees that it's always going to be sunny and, you know, everything's always going to be one way or another, but you got to go through the different stages. That's, I said, I don't, the life isn't full of challenges. Life is the challenge and there's different stages in your life that you go through and you need to rise up to them. You know, Lemon, they were young and there were only so many spots in the wrestling business to be in the top. They rose up to that challenge and they did it. Well, when they get older and they have kids and their kids are growing up and they depend on them for their philosophies of life so they can go out and strive to have happy lives and productive lives, then the challenge there is to rise up and be the mentor they need to have. Not continue to, you know, fantasize that you're still 20 years old and these are the goals you need to set for yourself. I'm not uh, encouraged by that. I'm disgusted by it. My kids are growing up in this world, and it's important to me that uh, there are more people like that than guys that, you know, that can still get in the ring and wear trunks 50 years old and bilk the business like they do. Um, is there anyone from the business you still talk to or remain in contact with? <laughs> what do you think? I think not, but yeah. I there, I, question. My phone's probably filled with voicemails this evening. <laughs> no. Um, 
I mean, I mean, I'm doing a whole different thing. I'm in a whole different place than these right. people. Uh, if you could come, if you had a choice for your one match to come back as warrior, mm. what would it be? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. No, I don't know okay. what that would be. Um, you said you would listen to a fair offer to come back to the business. If Vince McMahon called you with that offer, would you be interested? I didn't say a fair offer. I said it would be a damn good offer. Okay, if Vince McMahon came to you today with a damn good offer and said, what do we need to do to start fresh anew, it, could it happen? Look, even on my terms, even on my terms, there would be a way for that to happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a lot of terms. Okay. And there's no way that it could get twisted into something that it's not. How do you feel about the Ultimate Warrior character being used in uh, action figures and video games even today? I, I like it. I think it's great. Um, of course, Acclaim went under. Yeah. I couldn't believe that. Um, but I had a three-year deal with them. They renew it every year. And this, I had dinner with uh, Brian Shields, the guy in charge here in New York, about the end of May or something like that. And he said everything was a go to renew it. And the next thing you know, they went belly up. It's a good thing. I mean, back even when I was doing the comic book project, the idea was, you know, I went to Hollywood, I told you, I, because I wanted to do the action movies and things. But I started thinking it through, and people, even when people would say, you know, you should do action movies, later I started to think graphically created Warrior as an identity and his ideas and stuff. They could live forever. You know, it could be something bigger entrepreneurially. And so um, I like that. I, I pitched to Brian and I pitched to... Uh, a guy that represented me with THQ when they wanted to do the game of doing it, uh, a video game around uh, that presents challenges to, and obstacles in the game that are um, using throughout the game coming to define the concept of warrior. In other words, all the great games, they always use warrior as an adjective to describe their characters, right. even, even comic book characters, behaved, thought, fought as a warrior. And I thought it would be a great video game to, in the video game, have just the warrior. Why has he got to be anything other than that? If you, if you make him creative enough and intense enough all his own, warrior is warrior. And, uh, but they don't get it. Somebody will one day. Closing up, what do you think is the biggest misconception of warrior? That I'm uh, difficult to, to deal with in business or uh, that I don't, uh, I don't follow through on my obligations. And when uh, the exact opposite is true, that I refuse to tolerate people not following through on theirs. Okay. Uh, any regrets in your career? I, you know, I think everybody has regrets. I think I would, do, I wouldn't be completely honest if I said I didn't have any, but I don't let my regrets eat away at me. I sort of have an agreement with my regrets, you know, that um, I'll acknowledge that I have them but I'm not going to give them any, uh, allow them to, you know, disempower me in any way with getting on with my life and doing other things. Okay. Any final words for your fans who are watching this? Uh, just appreciation, I guess. You know, to keep it simple, that I appreciate that they gave me the opportunity to uh, let me engage my creativity and l let that, through Ultimate Warrior into their hearts and minds, and um, that I never forget that they did, and um, I appreciate it. Well, on behalf of everyone associated with Ringside Collectibles, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and thank you for your time. Thank you.
I can't take any credit for even knowing what the hell I was doing at the time. <laughs> but I kept paying attention. And after I got out of the business and had my fall off with Titan and stuff, uh, I went on and I kept building it in a different way in my personal life, in my professional life. And uh, if I never had, if you, the fans had never allowed me to creatively make that bond with them in their hearts and their minds, I never would have had those unique experiences. So I never ever forget. In fact, we have run over time here because they set it up. And you know, people that have followed my career know that there's millions of mischaracterizations about me. I'm an asshole, I'm hard to deal with, I don't fulfill my obligations. The truth is, the other people don't, and I hold them. I take them to task when they don't. I don't put up with any crap where people don't fulfill their obligations. But I don't have the bigger forms that other people do to get my side of the story out so people make up their own stories and the mischaracterizations that are out there. Even the people that put on this show, and I don't pull my punches with anybody, I don't cut anybody any slack. They set it up for me to sign autographs for two hours, thinking that I was going to sign autographs like everybody else. Just keep my head down, my eyes on the table, sign the autograph, not say the hello, not shake hands. And that's just not the way I am. Uh, I have to answer to a higher power too, and right now it's my four-year-old daughter Indiana and my two-year-old daughter Maddie, and tomorrow's Halloween, and Daddy better be home. <laughs> so, I think we're going to be able to get all the questions answering that you have or want. I hope so. Okay, first row. Anybody with a question? Right here. Hi. Uh, what uh, aspirations do you have for your kids? <laughs> well. People that have followed what I'm doing, I changed my name legally in, in 1993 to just the one name of Warrior. At the time, it didn't have anything to do with trying to go in the back door and uh, get wrestling jobs outside of WWF. It had to do with where I saw my wrestling, my, my entertainment career was going. I wanted to go to, I went to California, I talked to some people and I wanted to do action movies. I just wanted to use my look to do action movies. I was a huge fan of the Conan series. When Ar well, you know, being in bodybuilding and stuff, I was a huge fan of Arnold when he was up and coming. I'm not much of a fan of his anymore. <laughs> <laughs> For a lot of different reasons, you know. I mean, well, I'm not the same person I was back then. But I was interested in uh, doing some stuff in California. I went out there and lived for a while. And I thought, look, if I'm going to get people's attention here and I know exactly what I want to do, then this is what I'm going to do. So I changed my name to the one name of Warrior. And, uh, after about six months, I just couldn't take the phoniness of it out there anymore. And I said, I'm just not gonna, I don't want to do this. I can do other things in my life. But uh, later, after um, I went on and I started building my entrepreneurial projects with the comic book project and with the ultimate goal that I had with that was I wanted to make it an animated movie. I wanted it to have an empowering message. It would be you know, more power that, powerful than The Lion King or the, you know, all those other animated movies. I just thought Warrior was an idea that could really be something. And I still do, but uh, those things sort of got shelved after I got in my lawsuit with Titan. But to get back to what you're asking me, I met a woman that I wanted to spend my life with, and when we decided we were going to get married and have kids, she took Warrior as her last name, and my kids have it as their surname. And I've always been attracted, and I think a lot of people are, there's an attraction and an appeal to uh, traditional time historic times. It's like with all the crap that comes out in entertainment when a Braveheart or a Gladiator or something like that comes out. Everybody can think there's a feeling in your gut, man, that it's real. And um, so we decided that what we were going to do, even though we live in contemporary times and it's a 24-hour cycle, you know, here today, going tomorrow type of thing, and everybody's in and out of things very quickly and on to the next thing to get the next high, the next rush. We're living a more traditional life. Um, and we're going to teach our kids that their life means something and that it stands for something and you need to do in your life what will live forever. You need to think about it in bigger terms than just the 60 or 75 or 100 years that you get to live on this planet. And that's the way people used to look at their lives and they don't do it anymore. So we have a mission statement, we have a coat of arms, uh, both my girls have a creed and when they go out and do stuff, I could see them reciting, like my four-year-old just learned how to climb tree. And every branch she goes higher, I can see her mounting her creed. It's so cool. 
And uh, they're sponges. Kids are sponges. They don't know what's uh, the difference. They don't know that things are hard. They, you just give them something and they do it. And so my kids are being raised that way to understand, like I believe, that you have the potential to do anything in your life simply because you're a human being. There's, all of us have differences between one another. There's the, the physical differences, the different colored hair, the different body structures, the different personal preference differences that we have. You like chicken, I like steak. The different ethnic differences, the different environmental differences. We have different jobs, different family issues and stuff like that. But I think that we should teach little kids from the moment that they're born and we start teaching them their, their letters and their ABCs that we should say to them, you're a human being. And just let it sit for a while. And then again, you're a human being. And let them get what that means. It means that you're a different animal than everybody else. You've got a mind. You're born with a brain. And because you're born with a brain, the, the, the potential of your mind is unlimited. You can learn anything. You just make the effort to have the discipline. So they're going to be raised. Their philosophy of life is going to be that for a long time. And then when they go out and they face the, the challenges in life by themselves, they'll be prepared. Um, that's what it, you know, it, it means to me in a bigger way. <laughs> we got Michael over here from New Jersey. Michael? I was wondering, in your last match in WCW, you fought Hogan, do you, and you left afterwards. Do you have any grudges against him? No, I, well, that was a great match, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I did an interview. Well, I did an interview with that Slammer guy, and he was a real nice guy. I don't know if he's here or not. Or but I told him, I said, it's ironic that I had my best match and my worst match with the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he, didn't, he says, what was that quote? And I, so I repeated it, but he didn't put it in there as a quote. He turned it in. Well, the guy told me, the slammer guy said, I don't like to, you know, I don't like to be confrontational. I like to be, you know, just play it down the middle. So he ended up turning it into something that said, uh, I felt like I had such a bad performance that I decided to retire. And that's not what I said at all. I just said it like was a stinker of a man. Um, no, I don't, uh, I don't, you know, people will think that I have grudges because I'm so outspoken, they turn it into, you know, that I'm bitter. I'm not bitter, I'm not even mad at the McMahons. I wouldn't have the life that I have today. I would not have uh, uh, been able to go out and take on the different challenges that I have in my life if it wasn't for what McMahon and those people did to me. And uh, I'm totally, you know, I, I recognize all the time that it was a two-way street and the success of the Ultimate Warrior character the McMahon and the Titan organization, they won't do that. But uh, the, the, the truth is that Hogan has an insecurity complex, and they used Ted Turner's checkbook by me to come back so he could feel better about having done the job in 1990. And that's, you know, that says a lot about a person. So uh, I was disappointed. I thought it was a, I thought when I went back in the first 15 minutes, the interview I did in the ring where I was bringing back some of the, new life interest that I had, this new journey I was on to make Warrior something bigger than just what it was in the wrestling ring, that uh, I thought it was a great springboard and just incredible thing. But they didn't, they didn't see it that way. They were already with, you know, spending the least amount of time they could creatively to develop a show, uh, not plan. And uh, I knew then very shortly afterward. I mean, only, one person can only do so much. It takes a whole team of people to make it work. Am I bad? Do they have a grudge, like mad at them? No. I mean, I think it's all kind of funny. All kind of funny. Sorry. And this is AJ from Pennsylvania. In your opinion, what is your favorite match? Well, the Hogan is at the top, but I had a lot of great matches. You know, that's another mischaracterization. The Ultimate Warrior didn't have very many good matches. I think the WrestleMania 7 match with Savage is in the same category as the WrestleMania 6. Working my program, anybody that saw the, 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 the longer matches that I had with Andre, like the match I had with Andre at the Garden before we did the 30-second thing, was a great match. The cage matches I had with Savage were great. I had great matches with Rick Rude. Uh, somebody said, I mean, a couple years ago, before WCW went under, they did the wrestling magazine. They did the top 100 wrestlers of all time, and they didn't even put Ultimate Warrior in it. You know what I mean? To me, that just is a, it just clarifies to me just how great the character was and what kind of impact he had on the business. And, uh, you know, 
in the last year or so, I, I mean, I've always stood up and defended my character in his career. I've never had a problem with that. In some ways, that people don't like at all. It just makes them matter. But uh, I uh, always got along with everybody, and I always get every, everybody their, their due credit when they deserved it for the skills that they had. But when they start bashing my career and what I did in the career, then I get, uh, my chest gets a little bit, sticks out a little bit further. And I don't go for that. And, uh, okay, next question. Todd from Brooklyn. Hi, pleasure to see you. Two part question for you. Number one, if the WWE ever asked you to come back, even for an appearance for a brief stay, would you? And would you think about going into the WWE Hall of Fame and fast back? I get, that, I get asked that a lot. Um, I don't sit thinking about the Hall of Fame. Um, I think the ultimate war character is there. You know, he's already there. He I don't need a plaque on my wall to know that he's a character that. Hall of Famer. Thanks a lot, though. I appreciate that. Okay, this is Brandon from Long Island. Of all time, I had a lot of exciting moments and stuff like that. What was your most exciting moment ever in uh, WWE, WCW, whatever? What's, wh what moment did you feel like sh shocked at or something? Yeah. Well, my, you know, I would say my Hogan match. It was a whole different time, you know. Hogan was the guy, and the fact that they were going to do something like that and pass the torch and everything, uh, all the elements that went into making that match a classic, the chemistry, the baby face versus baby face that they hadn't done before, uh, the Warriors versus the Hulkamaniacs, uh, the two belt thing, the quality of the match. It wasn't a 10-minute match, it was a 30-minute match, and we both used some of the skills that, you know, that's another bad thing that people, you know, they mischaracterize. I mean, you have to know how to wrestle, you have to know, you know, I always make a joke, I never, I never learned how to wrestle. I knew how to entertain people, and I figured that out. I mean, you know, by shaking the ropes, man, when I started doing that at the beginning, everybody at the WWF said, don't do it. It looks bad. Don't do it, and uh, you know you probably won't be around too much longer if you do it. But I, I go, yeah, okay, yeah, and I go out and I hear them people. I say, screw that shit. I'm a <laughs> okay, we got Tim from West Virginia. All right, Warrior. Anyone that's been following your career for a while knows that you and Sting teamed as the Blade Runners in Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> And there was a long rumor going for a while in 1990 WCW that you were going to make an appearance as the Black Scorpion. Now, what I want to know is, was there any ever, was there talks after Memphis, after you went to WWF and Sting parted ways to the UWF later NWA, were you guys ever set to team up again during the course of your career? No. <laughs> no, I left uh, Watts' territory mid-south and went to Texas. And me and Steve parted ways there. We didn't see each other or talk again until uh, what year? Uh, uh, Ninety-one or ninety-two. I took a trip down there to Atlanta. Right. Well, and I talked to those guys. Right. But you were going to make an appearance as the Black Scorpion, so I was just wondering about that as well. So. No, uh, that's just another one of those conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jr. from Staten Island. Uh, hey, War. How are you? I'm very good. Uh, I have a question. I like to know uh, out of all of the stars in the business, particularly WWE, uh, who would you consider yourself getting in the ring with nowadays? Oh, I don't know. I mean, you know. Uh, well, look. I mean, the truth is, is I wouldn't come back into the rest. I mean, if there was an opportunity to come back, I and mean, this is a fantasy thing, then I, I would definitely, I could still do it for another five or six years. I know what kind of discipline I have to do things. But I certainly wouldn't come back and be any lesser version of what people expected of Ultimate Warrior. I mean, I wouldn't let the fans of the Ultimate Warrior carry me down. I'd be a total commitment on my part, and I'd come back and make those guys in the ring now look like they were anemic. <laughs> I'd, be changed, I'd be changed to do what I had to do during certain periods in the business where there were rules you had to follow, or you didn't have a job. I mean, you know, the can of worms is pretty much open. I mean, you know. 
you know, read between the lines. There's a lot of things people do today. I mean, uh, I don't know. I would have liked to have had something going on with Goldberg. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when he came on the scene, there was a natural comparison about the intensity. You know, the intensity factor always set Ultimate Warrior apart. And uh, that would have been great. Because, you know, they had their heads up their butts over there at WCW. I mean, they were falling apart so much. There was nobody running the show. Hunter from Connecticut. Who is the stiffest guy you've ever worked with? <laughs> Maybe, how do you know that? <laughs> Your dad tell you to ask that? Yeah, kind of. Who's the stiffest guy? Uh, well, probably nobody was more stiffer than I was. <laughs> I like the word stiff. Bruiser Brody was stiff. And it was dead. When I was in Texas, it was a time. Hercules was stiff. Was Bruiser Brody was stiff in a way that, you know, I was new in the business and I thought that's the way it was supposed to be, where you really beat the crap out of one another. But they, uh, he really tried to put me out of the business a few times. But, you know, I was so big and thick at that time and uh, ignorant that he didn't get the job done. But, uh, Hercules. Oh, other guy. I mean, you know, it's different. It's not like if somebody just come up behind you and coke cock you, you know, tap you on your shoulder and just laid one in on you. You can take a pretty good punch, man, when you're in the middle of the ring and you're all sweaty. You can take a pretty good potato and it doesn't do any chair or anything else. But uh, I like to work snug. I think it's what made the Ultimate Warrior work, too. You know, I mean, that's what the business is about. Mike from Poughkeepsie, New York. I was just wondering, um, what was it like to work with Randy Savage and Elizabeth? Well, I didn't work with Elizabeth. I worked with Randy. Sherry was with Randy when I worked with him. Randy's a great guy. Randy's another guy that's mischaracterized as being a good. I guess if you're really mischaracterized as being a good, it probably means that you probably got more, you got your head on your shoulders more straight than everybody else. Very intense. And we, we fed off one another's intensity. I mean, like two or three hours before a match, We'd be going over the match in the back like we were outside in front of the crowd. I like Randy. And he's a very stand-up guy, too. Bobby from White Plains. Yeah, well, I just want to know um, if you still follow sport in terms of the Pete Stars now from WWE, who do, who do you like the most? I don't watch it. I mean, you know, you can't miss it. Even if I go to Walmart or something, you see the magazine. Uh, and I get enough, people send me enough emails. But I haven't watched I haven't watched WWF WWE since 1996, and I haven't watched uh, last time I watched David Wrestling was in 1998 WCW. I go on with my life. I just do other things. Dave from New York. Well, since it sounds like you might be done with wrestling, why don't you run for president of the United States? <laughs> Todd from New Jersey. Okay. What's up, Warrior? Um, I've always wanted to know, ever since I was a little kid, um, where did you come up with the, or where was it designed the theme song when you came into WWF, that guitar riff? Where did that come from? They do that. They have their own people that do that. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if it was a friend or something. No. Uh, Warrior, I have a bit of a request. Could I possibly get some sort of WrestleMania 6 like promo right now? <laughs> I did it on the radio. I did an interview for this thing. Oh, it was horrible. He said, can I do like a fill the power or something like that? After I did it, I said, oh, man. What's the war you saw? Okay, Ira. Um, I was wondering how you felt those, about those rumors all those years that you had died or was it another, another man that was playing your character? How you felt about those rumors? Well, you know, they were rumors. I mean, I never looked at myself and question whether or not I was the guy that did it, you know, I didn't fall for him. I don't know. I mean, the Renegade thing I thought was funny. I really thought that what they were doing was they did that character expecting me to show up and demand to, you know, resume my, my rightful role as the real character or something. It was uh, all pretty funny to me. John from Staten Island. Um, who did you like fear? 
when you wrestled? No one. Slaughter! Slaughter! Andre the Giant, I mean, he, you know, fear him, but Andre does what he wants to do. Donald from New Jersey. Um, was Soldier Slaughter your big, your most embarrassing loss in wrestling? I don't know. I don't know. Embarrassing. I mean, think of all the goofy stuff I did. <laughs> I mean, you know, I never really got embarrassed. A lot of people would disagree with you and say Papa Shango was the worst. <laughs> No, look, you don't get in a position in a business like that unless you won't drop you won't drop the bell. I mean, it's like everything else creatively. Uh, sometimes your ideas aren't the best and sometimes they're better. You can always make adjustments along the way and fix things as you go along. Um, I thought it was a good thing. I mean, if I had not done that, Randy had not been involved, then I couldn't say that the match between me and Randy is a retirement match. You know, one day one door closes, another one opens up. You can't, uh, if you're in a business like that and you're working at the pace that you are, you can't really overtake things like that. Kim from New Jersey. What were your first thoughts when you were approached about having a classic figure? Um, well, I didn't like the first Jack figures that they came out with. I didn't like those. I think a couple of people had them, the bone crunching one. Yeah. I didn't like them. And I always was a little upset when they came out with the dolls because what they used to do in the early 90s was they, uh, while you were on the road, they put you in a studio all day, and they take pictures of you. You know, profile pictures, back shots, and it's like anything else that gets done in the studio. It's never done in one take. It takes like all day. And uh, I always used to think, um, and then when they started coming out with the figures, I said, why the hell should I spend a whole day in a studio? You take a picture of my body. I said, all the other guys got muscles, and they never even go to the gym. <laughs> you know? And uh, so you know everybody's got the body. That 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 yeah, that upsets me a little bit. I like the classic figures. I think they look great. And uh, part of my deal was they did a limited edition figure, a five, a Warrior America figure, and it's just awesome. And it's really cool. It just sold in the collector's market for the most money anybody ever paid for. It just says something else again about Ultimate Warrior as a as a an identity and persona. Joe. Um, hi. Uh, you said that uh, when Hulk Hogan body slammed uh, Andre the Giant, what about when you par uh, Paris slammed him, Andre the Giant? Yeah, that's pretty incredible, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the first time he told me, but I do remember when he told me at the garden that night I did it there. You know, I had my head stuck in his armpit. You know, I had him in a bear hug, you know, and he would, the ultimate warrior would get him in a bear hug and he'd squeal like a pig, you know, like he was killing him. He could barely even hook my hand. And uh, I had my head stuck in his armpit and he says, slow bolt, he said. I thought, whoa, man, I don't know. <laughs> but I went for it and it happened. It, that was pretty awesome, man. To do something like that, that's pretty impressive stuff. Hey, Tito. Hi, Warrior. Uh, I want to ask. Um, speaking, of, like you were talking about bodies and stuff. How 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 is your physical regimen like? Are you still intensely into bodybuilding? And if you were a wrestler, again, could you still power slam or do the gorilla press the same way? Are you still capable well, of physical? I trained to go back into the ring. I need a few months to get back into the ring. My body weight is lighter by about 25 or 30 pounds because I don't. Mostly because of the food, eating the kind of food and stuff that you need, the you know, quantity of food you need to eat. And just the attention and dedication you give to your training and stuff, training twice a day and everything. I still train like a maniac. I love training. I always will love training. And uh, I still train like a bodybuilder, bodybuilding style training, but I don't, you know, I'm not doing any competitive bodybuilding. I have other interests in my life. I mean, to do an Ultimate Warrior character, to be in that kind of shape is a full-time job. Between eating and training and rest and stuff is probably, and then the rest of the day just thinking about it is eight, nine, ten hour a day job. And um, I have other goals in my life, but I have other responsibilities. Okay, we just have two more questions. Michael. Uh, I just want to know about um, when you faced Triple H at WrestleMania 12 and beat the crap out of him. Uh, he wasn't over at all, and he does some complaining about that now. Yeah, I just want to know what you have to say about it. 
Look, it was funny. It not, wasn't anything personal. It's just that what happened was, is I've been out of the business for three years. And Vince had started utilizing uh, great talent themselves. John Michaels and all those guys are great talent. They have their own skills that they offer, they bring to the table. It just so happens that Ultimate Warrior, Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, those are the people people want to see and bought tickets to. They want to see the gimmicks. came back, I didn't know Hunter. I didn't know who he was or what he was doing. I didn't, I wasn't following, I didn't watch any of the TV. But those guys were the B-team players when Hogan and me and Macho Men were there. And not to take anything away from them, it's just the truth. So when I came back, I wasn't going to devalue what the Ultimate Warrior character was just to try to fit in. Would I over time? Yeah, and I did. That was the plan. But the thing to do when I came back to 96 or, uh, was to make a statement. You know, to say Ultimate Warrior, the Ultimate Warrior, the Ultimate Warrior that you remember is back. And he's not in the same league as Hunter now playing Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart and all those guys. And uh, it's kind of funny because he wanted to do more stuff. And I told him what we were going to do. I said, no, you're going to be here to finish. I'm going to kick you out. We're going to go home. That's <laughs> 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 a story, you know, that will be in my book one day. But uh, he went and got Jerry Briscoe. They came in the locker room and went to the bath in the shower room, you know, that's where you guys would go to the shower room to get privacy to talk about their matches and stuff. And Jerry Briscoe proceeds to tell me what he obviously wanted to tell me. So I put my hand up to Jerry Briscoe and I said, I looked at Hunter and I said, if you ever have anything you want to talk to me about, you come to me and you talk to me about it face to face, man to man. And I said, we're done here. And probably in some ways, to be truthful, that probably, because I know how something like that would have affected me. It probably would have been a burn my butt to say, we'll see, we'll see. And he, you know, he, he is going, he, he's coming an incredible way. I don't know what kind of person he is personally. But the guy's definitely going places in the business. Yeah, I mean, he backed up the Brinks truck. <laughs> okay, this is Jerry from New Jersey. How you doing? Well, we all just want to basically know, uh, where does Warrior go from here? What's the future hold? Any kind of books coming out, DVDs, anything going on or what? I mean, I want to see that Andre match again. When you, when you body slam him, man, that was great. Um, well, we just started revamping my website. I've been talking about that for a long time. Uh, being a father takes up a lot of my time. But I have, over the last couple of years, I've built a, a speaking career. Going out to schools, using what I used to do to get young people's attention, and then talk about how power in your life comes from in your mind, not your muscles. That's the simple message. The bigger message is I go out and I work with Ronald Reagan's foundation and Young America's foundation. You can find out more about them through the internet. There are organizations that work with 800 college campuses with young groups of kids on those campuses that are active. In, they're thinking about more than just partying in school. They're thinking about world ideas already. And uh, that the next step of that is that I, you know, I go out and talk about um, where we are in the country. Uh, philosophically and politically and stuff. So I built a career doing that, and uh, that keeps me really busy. I've been working on my book forever. I don't want somebody else to ghostwrite it, but I also just don't want to do an ABC storytelling of my career year by year, month by month. A lot of that is going to be in there, a lot of great stories nobody's ever heard before. But I also want to write about how having that career, that unique career, has made me the man I am today and has made me look at life the way I do today from a mentoring perspective. Um, typically when I go out to college campus, there will be 15, 20, or 30 people part of the group. The rest of the place fills up with kids that were 10-year-old wrestling fans, Ultimate Warrior fans. And my responsibility from having had, and this is why I'm so critical of some other people that don't grow up, my responsibility is to go out and positively and effectively mentor young people. Use my life experiences to do that. It's not to go out and be friends with these people and just continue to rehash and over and over memories of Ultimate Warrior. That's a great chapter of my life, but uh, you know, once you have kids and you look at the outside your front door and you see what's going on in the world, it's important to understand that you have a responsibility for young people. I mean, I'm 45 years old. I'm not 20 years old. I don't need to act like a 20 year old. And uh, that's the way my life has taken me. So that's what I'm doing. I'm building that career to do those kind of things. 
My website has just been a presence forever and ever. There's probably about 700 to 1,000 pages of writings there. And, you know, if anything else, you would be funnily entertained if you go there and read what I write. I mean, I don't pull any punches about anything. And uh, I draw a real hard moral line about behavior. And, uh, but not in a prudish sense. Just that I'm sick and tired of people whining and complaining about how difficult life is or finding themselves in a difficult spot and then they just sit in their pile of crap and they don't get on with doing what they need to do to make their life work. I don't have any sympathy for people like that. I don't want my kids growing up in a world that's filled with people that think and believe like that. Ultimate Warrior was a character, um, what I did in the ring, that gives me the ability to go out and get in people's face and talk about bigger ideas just as intensely. And uh, I know that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I know all my experiences that I've had, even when I was a little kid and I was scared of my own shadow, you know, I used to create you know, fantasy characters in my mind to, to give me my confidence you know, and stuff like that. The experiences I had as a young man, the experiences I had in bodybuilding, the experiences I had creating and evolving a character like Ultimate Warrior. And then later on, having the fallouts I did with Vince McMahon, and when everybody else that worked for the company is basically like, you know, how much further do I have to bend over? I'll just take it because it's so good. I said, no, this just it, it not, it doesn't really fit right. This doesn't work very well. It would have been easy just to said, you know, stuck with the game and taking the money and the fame and just had my head filled with the celebrity and said, yeah, this is what life, that's not what life's about. So I did the harder thing. And um, it's not always easy, you know, but maybe that's what makes it so good. I appreciate that everybody came out here. We want to thank you, Warrior. I know this group loves you. Thank you very much for having me stay here.